It's day three of the celebrational here in Queenstown in New Zealand. Craig and Flake. Sounds like a breakfast cereal. Yep. Part of a balanced breakfast. Here we are for you. Exactly that. We've got the finals. Finally, we went through two days of very, very unique formats to come down to this. It is going to be a best of three. Brody Spurlock, Kelvin Law. Yeah, I mean, two two of the top players in the field coming into the event. Uh, absolutely exciting round after round after round, watching them play all of these different formats. And now it comes down to this. It does come down to this and what's on the line. Well, there's a really cool trophy. But more than that, you're kind of cementing your legacy beyond just being the first ever celebrational champion. You will have your own card design and likeness made into an official legal flesh and blood card. An amazing opportunity. I've been a relatively successful gamer for a very, very long time, and I do not have a card. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about Brody's card here. Uh, oh, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that? Is it too early? You need a little bit more caffeine before we go through the... We want to ease the viewers into something like this. Exactly. If you are a member of Mensa, you do have an advantage into deciphering these kind of cryptics that he put together yes. for this one. Uh, Brody's card. I mean, what is there more to say? I have been trying to explain it. He has been trying to explain it. You and I have gone through the mental gymnastics of trying to parse out what exactly is this. Now, Craig, talk about this. Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it's an aura. It's a zero cost, blue pitch, three defense value. These are all very good things, right? Sure. I, you got to love it. Absolutely. And then there is a wall of text. <laughs> and keep in mind, and uh, we mentioned this yesterday, this has gone through more revisions than you know a science textbook this thing is unreal um this is the this is the best version so far that we've come through so so last night at dinner with the, kind of some of the lss team they were talking about how the the what you want to do is find what what part of this did brody really want to get on a card was it the the tutor effect where you go searching was it the the secret bidding part of the card. And then, you know, they'll help him from there and massage it down to something that's a little more simple, a little more streamlined. And he'll end up with a card that does resemble this in some way, but I, I would think much more simplified. All right, we're not going to go into the details of it, but I'm going to read you the card, ladies and gentlemen. And here it is as Brody has made it. It is. At the start of your turn, each player may pay one life. If no one pays life, destroy this. Reveal all but one card in your hand. Then you and target hero each secretly bid between zero and five life. Each player reveals and loses the life they bid. If the targeted hero bid more than you, they may discard a card and choose a revealed card for you to discard. Otherwise, search your deck for a card, add it to your hand, then shuffle. Are you following along here? Are you following along here? You there's, need. There's a lot going on. Yeah, this card requires GPS tracking. It is that kind of out there. Now, like you said, you're trying to figure out, is this a tutor card? Is this a disruption card, a life, a life loss card? We don't know. It's a little bit of everything, frankly. Um, but it, it, that's what it is. But uh, Kelvin also submitted a card, but I want to get to the formats that got us to where we are right now, Craig. Okay. So let's uh, have a look at what uh, what we're going to be seeing and how we got to where we are. Day one was exciting. That was the first one. Everybody was fresh-faced and all smiles. Rounds one to four was something called Underdog Blitz. What is Underdog Blitz, Craig? I, I loved this format. It was really fun to watch. It's, uh, all the Blitz heroes that have less than 100 Living Legends points, we saw a pretty diverse field and some really fun matches. So, yeah, again, under 100 Living Legend points, it kind of brings out out of the woodwork some of these heroes that may not get a sniff otherwise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we're going to be seeing today as well. Let's go to the day, the second part of day one, which was uh, the, the heavy hitters pre-cons. Yeah. I, I mean, th this was just such a treat, getting to see all of these heroes, uh, the brand new heroes, the brand new mechanics, really being executed by some of the top players in the world. And... It, it, it was so enlightening as, as we're moving into pre-release weekend, we've got some callings coming up all over the world. And so I mean, even for me, I felt like this was so educational seeing what the heroes are supposed to be doing. And the added bonus here was the fact that the players did not know what pre con hero they were going to get, nor did they know the contents of those decks. So it was very exciting to see the players kind of explore and experience the deck for the first time alongside us. That was day one. Let's move on to day two. This was yesterday. We had uh, three rounds of something called Heavy Hitters Solo CC. And, and for me, this was 
probably the most surprising format because I thought that the power level was going to be scaled back. It was going to be a, a, a little more anemic watching the gameplay, and it wasn't that at all. We had some very exciting matches, uh, lots of, of just massive attacks going back and forth, and some, some really interesting decks you know, being constructed out of only one set. It was really enjoyable. And beyond that, it was a matter of uh, players had the agency to choose the heroes they want. They weren't assigned a hero. And each player kind of had their own ideas of, no, this is this is the truth. You know, is it Kasai? Is it Ko? Some players uh, brought Reinar and had a great time. So that was how we started off day two. Let's go on to the final rounds of yesterday to choose, basically pair down to the finalists my favorite format and it is living legend yeah i think this is quickly becoming the cadillac format for <laughs> flesh and blood right this this is the premiere this is the high roller bowl if you will where players get to do all the most powerful things uh, we saw a lot of starvo being quite successful but i mean interestingly enough Brody showed up as the only Lexi player, and here he is in the finals. Incredible, yeah. No, you're right. The Cadillac, the heated leather seats, the yep. moonroof, the whole nine yards. You get to play with so many toys, but Bravo did get kind of nerfed a little bit, but still had an incredible show. Brody, the only Lexi player, here he is in the finals. So Lexi's got legs. All right. Here we are today. It is day three of the finals, which, again, is a very unique kind of grouping of, uh, of matches. It's going to be a best of three, and it's going to be such that you have Underdog Blitz, you have the, uh, the CC, the Heavy Hitter Solo CC, and then Living Legend, a best of three series. Now, the interesting part about this, Craig, is that the number one seed, which is Brody, gets to choose uh, not only what the first mat the first format is going to be but whether he goes first and second or or second and then the loser of game one will choose the next round yeah so, so the strategy here is going to be let, let's start with what i'm most confident in where i think i have the biggest edge and you know you, you don't want to save that one for last and potentially not even get to play that format so brody has dialed up uh heavy hitter solo for us here he's going to be on ko uh on the other side, Kelvin playing Betsy, and Brody has chosen to go second in this matchup. It's, it's a pretty interesting decision. It definitely, and uh, Brody uh, just deciding to go second, and the, we do not know what the second format will be because that will be the decided by who loses this particular match. Now, I suspect this is going to go the distance. This is going to be a three-game series. Both of these players are honestly top dogs, uh, lifetime XP champion, oh, yeah. the most XP, second in the world, Brody Spurlock. And Brody actually mentioned, he's like, um, unique little part about this, a little extra sauce on what's on the line. This counts as a one XP armory. <laughs> so the winner of this also gets one XP to their name. So it either closes the gap or widens the gap that extra little bit. You know, they call them like, this is a two point game kind of like, yeah. you don't want to fall behind. So the players are ready to go, ladies and gentlemen. Again, it is day three, the finals of the celebrational here in Queenstown, New Zealand. I'm excited to be here, Craig, alongside you. It's amazing. This whole experience has been great, but we're here for flesh and blood, and we've got two of the world's best. Yeah, and, and this is going to be a lot of fun to watch. We saw, you know, the, the KO decks in this format kind of executing on, on a pretty high level. Um, I had speculated if there was a big enough card pool to take advantage of the static KO ability, adding that extra power to all of your attacks when they're not on the combat chain. And... You know, the answer is yes, there were definitely enough cards there to do this. And this is a treat not only for you and I, Craig, but for everybody watching because, let's be real, uh, we've got savage feats behind the wheel of this one. We get the the hand cams. Yep. We get all of the goodies here. This is going to be amazing to digest. Uh, there it is, absolutely. And there's the trophy. Put that back up if you can there, Ethan. That is what they're, they're also playing for. It's, it's great to have the prize of your own card. Um, but yeah, uh, and here's another thing about Savage Feats, but they're probably going to regret letting me know about. Oh man, all the bells and whistles here. Oh, hello. I can do this. So <laughs> here it is. Uh, if you want oblong circles. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can just, there we go. See, there it is. Yep. Uh, and that's how it all goes away. Uh, I, I was told middle button. There we go. Perfect. So we do have a little John Madden-esque uh, ability. I should have had the Telestrator to try to draw a graph of how Brody's card worked. Yeah, but then 
you, you also need to do the John Madden voice while you do it. Yeah, 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 you see, when, 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 you, when you play a card and, 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 and it goes in your discard pile, that, that's, that's one less card from your deck. See, I, I didn't think you were actually going to have that dialed up, but I love that you did. Some, there's the voices, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of them, they just show up like a seance. So, yeah, day three, Craig, um, any highlights so far for you uh, from this entire experience? Honestly, it, it was the high-level play that we saw out of not the top competitors. I, I was really impressed. Everyone took this event very seriously. They were staying up late. There was lots of conversation at all of the dinners, all of the activities about what people are playing, why they're playing it, what's the best decisions to make for matchups, and just, just watching people really, really giving 100% to each format. It was, it was an absolute blast. So once again, just to explain to you, this is the first game of three. It's the solo uh, solo CC, heavy hitters. You only have access to heavy hitters cards. We have access to all the heavy hitters cards. So we're going to see some of those uh, new Majestics. We're going to see the legendary equipment come into play. Um, and like you mentioned, you made a good point. You thought that perhaps, you know, a limited card pool, sure, mm -hmm. but maybe it's going to be a little bit of a power down. But we saw some real haymakers yesterday. Yeah, this, this set is deep. There's a lot of space to explore. There's a lot of abilities, and there's a lot of power to it. And I, I think, you know, a couple of the previous sets, we might not have had as high of a power level to where the sets couldn't stand alone. But th this is one that certainly works. Now, it's going to be Betsy the Guardian versus KO minus an arm, which is unique. But we were looking at cards, for example, like Cast Bones which uh, made a debut yesterday on stream. And, it, you know, it didn't necessarily uh, blow the roof off in terms of power ability, but you got to think that a card like Cast Bones, which had um, so much ceiling potential to it, when you're playing with a wider card pool, mm -hmm. finding six off the top, like mm -hmm. six in a row, you got to think that that's going to be a lot more common than perhaps some people might think it would be. I think that f like four, between four and five has to be the average. Sure. I, I think we should start by just running down KO's ability. Just yes, for, absolutely. For, for the viewers that might not be familiar with all of these new heroes. So KO's ability, for those who are unaware, uh, first of all, he's armed and dangerous, but it's a single arm. Uh, and frankly, it's not that it's tied behind his back. We don't know where it went. He left it at the airport or something. It didn't make it through customs. Uh, too many risky wagers, maybe. Correct, yeah. So uh, you can only have one one-handed weapon. But beyond that, any attack action that exists outside of the combat chain in any zone outside of the combat chain will have plus one attack. You might be thinking, how the hell does that matter? Because it's an attack value, but if it's not dealing damage, well, when you're discarding sixes, mm -hmm. fives are now sixes. Yeah, yeah. The, there's a lot of brute cards out there that care about six power cards getting discarded, getting drawn, getting revealed, and KO is, is pumping all of those five power cards up to six. All right, so we're starting off here. Kelvin Law, the worldwide XP leader, has decided to go ahead and bust up Vigor Girth to create a Vigor token. Now, what is he giving up here? He's giving up the Blade Break, the one block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is a pretty interesting decision on these, these pieces of armor because the, the tokens can be exceptionally powerful, but you don't know how good, the good they're going to be on your next turn because you haven't drawn those cards yet. We're starting off here. Again, uh, in terms of that choosing to go second, you do get some of the momentum back. You do sort of be able to start and, you know, threaten cards out of hand. This is Assault and Battery, Beat Chest, a brand new mm -hmm. uh, card mechanic. Yeah, and, and we're seeing Brody take advantage of, of all of the abilities here on KO, where he, he gets an additional Might token anytime he discards a six-power attack. Uh, it, it makes it much easier for him to beat Chest, getting the buff on all of his attacks through the KO ability, and He's going to be set up for a very big next turn with additional Might Token and Agility Token. Beat Chest is certainty that Brutes were typically not necessarily always, always had access to. It was always about random, rolling dice and such. This is one where if you're beating Chest, you're, you're pick and choosing. You've got the crosshairs on one card that you want, want to discard, which he does, in this case, creating an Agility Token. And we saw how important Agility Tokens were for, let's say, a hero like Kasai, but... Agility for a Brute is is very strong and powerful when a lot of their cards will not have a go-again attached to it. Absolutely. Traditionally, you know, the, the Brute players had to be a little bit risky trying to pick up those go-agains or those extra action points, and the Agility token is just the guaranteed payoff for you. Uh, I'm th I think this is money where your mouth is. Love it. 
times two. Yep. Let's go money where your mouth is two times. And again, just increasing the value, the, uh, the, the reach of one of those attacks by plus three. And also, you may wager a gold token. When you're wagering, gold is the pinnacle. That is the, that elite currency. Oh, my goodness. And this, th this is a Betsy turn right here. This is exactly what you want to be doing if you show up with Betsy. A, a massive attack, and it's been given overpowered by the Betsy ability, so it's going to be so hard for Brody to block this out. And one of the interesting things that we've talked about all week long, when your opponent has a lot of these tokens that, that pop at the start of their turn, if, if they have to block out with their hand, they don't get the benefit of those tokens. This feels like a train robbery. You're coming in with the double money where your mouth is. The overpower ability by Betsy, meaning you only block with one attack action or one action card. And suddenly you're having, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a scale down dominate to a degree. However, Brody is, is going to be a little bit worse for wear. If this was like a 9 or an 8, you can maybe sort of cobble together a way to get around this, but a 14 overpower with three gold tokens around the bend on this. Kelvin, I mean, this is a very potent turn. Yeah, this is such a big attack. It, you know, sometimes you consider, is this where I cash in all of my armor and my block card and one of the cards from my hand and I covered? No, 14 is so big, I, I don't think Brody's going to be able to cover it no matter what. And three gold tokens, I mean, we, we've seen it all week long. The gold is deceptively powerful. It's kind of a payoff unto itself where you're able to just cycle through your deck when you've got a bad turn and it's just sitting there waiting for you on your, your good turns. You just, just swing it to the next turn. And I mean... For match one, Kelvin might might have just taken a stranglehold of this game, and, and we'll see if it snowballs from here. It's still early. It's definitely recoverable, but this is the kind of start that you want, absolutely, is three gold tokens. Now, traditionally, gold tokens in conjunction with one of the new heroes like Kasai. You can use that with raise an army and, and create a board full of allies that can be threatening. In this case, even just pitching to draw cards and sort of cycle through is very, very um, uh, a good way to sort of just go ahead and fix bad hands if necessary. So Brody here is going to be looking how to... It's going to get through, Craig. I mean, there's no secrets here, but what's the best card to give up? What's the best, um, the best case scenario in terms of, of coming back from this? And every time I see Wage Gold, I'm, I'm always just... I don't know, I'm really excited for this new universal ability. The, absolutely. I think that's a very potent uh, or very astute observation here. Again, universal, a new keyword as well. Basically, when it's in any zone, it's the same class of, as your hero. Otherwise, it's just, uh, it's kind of like this shape shifting card to a degree. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it, it, it's a big attack to start. So uh, there's going to be lots of decks that want to explore putting it in their list. And a little cackle by betsy there because she made a wager that she knew that she was going to win absolutely there's no way it's like you're holding a straight flush and someone raises you craig you're yep. like yep you get that little grin on your face so three gold in the pocket for kelvin law here and brody is going to do his best to start coming back ko is an aggressive hero you want to be coming back strong here brody down to 29 what a start for kelvin yeah, but this, this is look, looks like a very strong turn for Brody as well. Runner Runner is another card that I've been really impressed with as we've gone through this week. Well, in conjunction with the agility token, right, this is a very, very good card to follow up on that. So basically what Runner Runner is doing is that if you have Go Again, if it has Go Again, um, you create another agility token. So there's the Runner Runner. You're sort of setting up for potentially another go at the same kind of uh, turn here. Agility tokens break at the beginning of the turn, give the first uh, attack go again. In this case, that's kind of the, the ideal follow-up to those agility tokens. Yeah, yeah, I mean, two for six with go again and swinging an agility token to the, the next turn is a, a very strong rate. KO also had a Might token, so that's why you see seven attack on this. So Might tokens break and then give plus one to the next attack that comes through. So seven attack for Runner Runner, giving it seven go again. Not a bad response here, frankly. I mean, Brody got knocked around uh, with a 14 or was it 12 for 14 point attack. That is devastating, especially with the overpower. But if you can follow that up after that just brutality... If you go seven into something like a five, six, or even another seven, you're feeling good. You're feeling like, all right, we're playing at parity here. I mean, there's three, still three gold there. Like, the, that's a the, whole other thing. The three gold is a lot because if Kelvin, you know, uses a couple of his cards to block, 
goes to his own turn with, with, let's say, two blue cards, he's able to just chain those into new cards while floating resources. So it's almost like he's got more than a two-card hand. Runner, runner. Looks like it's going to get blocked out here. 4-1. Uh, one, one leaking, I believe. And... All right, a yellow bear fang. So this is the draw discard option. Now this is where KO's ability can kind of kick in because you're drawing and discarding, and you know that that brute kind of fear of picking up one of those fives that you hate seeing. KO will knock that up to a six. So the bear fangs here looks like it was uh, it was a seven, bringing Kelvin down to twenty nine. Oh no, sorry, did he whiff? He was a whiff. My bad. So it is a five attack here, going down to twenty nine is Kelvin. So again. A, a absolutely massive turn by Kelvin is matched by an equally effective turn by Brody, and now we're back down to 29 apiece. Yeah, I, I think Brody got a little bit unlucky there on that turn where, you know, whiffing on, on the random draw discard means that he doesn't carry an extra might token and he misses two additional damage from the bear fangs. And, you know, with, with each of these turns being so effective, th those little points of damage could be the difference. Wagering a Vigor token here is Kelvin Law, 7 attack. And again, when you're wagering a card like Vigor, yeah, it's it's you want to win it, obviously. And seven's such an awkward number to block unless you have one of those block cards in hand, potentially, or you want to give up some equipment in order to cover up those awkward break points of, you know, 4 and 7 and such. Uh, Kelvin, I think, here is would, would happily give him a Vigor token if he wants to. But uh, he also knows that there's an Agility token there on, on behalf of the runner runner from the previous turn so if if Brody has a great hand here he can just possibly maybe you know maybe not necessarily worry too much about the vigor token if he can send it back just very very thick yeah it's tough like you said he wants Brody wants to take advantage of this agility token every turn that he has one which means he's going to have to have that that three or four card hand and in order to cover up this seven attack it's going to you know generally take two cards out of his hand plus maybe even a piece of equipment as well. Like looking at these dual class cards, this one here being a guardian and warrior uh, combination that Betsy can have access to, you know, you think about these cards uh, for the other guardians that are out in the field and, you know, creating wagers that'll get you get you card uh, tokens like might. And then those might tokens that will have synergies with cards from like, let's say thump even where it goes above and beyond creates a dominate and an on hit effect. It's like these tokens here in the generation will, this is sort of new landscape that players are exploring here in this particular format, but you got to think beyond that in the wider, wider birth of flesh and blood CC. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think about is that it's going to be really hard to show up with some phantasm effects in the near future. Oh, sure. Definitely. So Knucklehead, the Brute Equipment, the head here, KO specialization. And uh, you know what Brutes do. They roll dice. And this one's basically roll a six-sided die until the end of your turn. Your base intellect is the number rolled. That, my friend, is a gamble. That, yeah, that is. That, this is often going to be uh, a, a last-ditch effort that you, you might make. I, I don't think we're going to be seeing the knucklehead activated very often oh no that that knucklehead i think to me is most definitely just a three block in most cases but like you said sometimes when push comes to shove you got to take a risk here but but you need some significant fortitude to be able to roll the dice and say like and live and die by it but that's what brute players do brute players are built different bear fangs so once so again brody gave up a, a ton he, he, he sold the farm to block out that card, but it looks like he's still going to have a great turn here where he, he's coming in with a red attack, a bear fangs, which is eight. It's going to have go again, and Brody's still going to have his two resources floating to, to follow this up with a ball breaker. So a very strong turn out of Brody off of only a two-card hand. Right. Pretty it, that, impressive. Very impressive. And again, discarding the wild ride means that ball breaker is going to be swinging for four. So... Coming out with a two-card 12 split over two pieces, massive, massive turn. So we're seeing some of the capabilities of these heroes within just the landscape of heavy hitters itself. It's impressive. And like you said, this is not a toned-down format. You can swing pretty big here. And, and so much of this value that he's getting is off of the back of the agility tokens that he's had throughout the game. And so it, it just goes to show as, as you move into your, your seal deck formats, your draft formats, the agility token is going to be a card that, I, you know, 
parts that produce agility tokens, I will prioritize very high. Eight go again. Both players at 29 here. Again, this is game one of three in the finals. And the best of three is three different formats. Brody decided to choose heavy hitters solo CC. And the loser of this game will choose the next, be it underdog blitz or what I'm hoping for. Let's go for that living legend. That That is going to be a spectacular matchup if we get it. And I, I think you and I are both pulling for that one. Well, you brought Lexi to U.S. Nationals. Mm -hmm. You had an incredible run finishing in the top four on Lexi. You know, you have such a, an astute understanding of that hero. What do you think that hero, what does that hero have into that format? Like, you know, where are the strengths and weaknesses? We can get into more depth here in, when we get to that format. But just, you know, in passing, you got to think that, the, that Lexi has, has legs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I hope we have some more time to talk about that when the match comes up. So we're going to block out uh, six here, I believe. Going down to 27 is Kelvin. No on hit effects for Bear Fangs, just the old-fashioned damage. But the ball breaker now coming in for four because the six was discarded. Yeah, two for four is a, a good rate on a weapon. Like, you think about it, and you look at this in conjunction with something like uh, um, one of the Guardian Hammers, like Titan's Fist, for example. Titan's Fist is a, is a natural three. You always see it as a four, like, or most more likely than not, because you're pitching, you're building the deck around make, maximizing it. This has a little bit more of a difficult condition to meet to get to four, but a lot of people don't think, yeah, just don't understand that Titan's Fist is a three. You have to build around it, and it just kind of fits, it synergizes, but yeah. Ball Breaker as a two for four, that is very good value. Yeah. 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 All right, so Kelvin Law at 25, Brody making it awkward, and Kelvin's still sitting on a little pile of gold there. He's, uh, he's working on his smog impression. Sure, yeah, and it felt like Kelvin wasn't very happy with his previous hand, and he decided it was much better value for him to be blocking out with it and then, you know, going going back to another turn, maybe Brody doesn't have that agility token this turn, so he's not going to have as effective of an attack. One of the cards in Kelvin's hand there, Lightning Press. Now, again, the attack reactions, you'd think, like, why aren't these players playing Pummel? Well, again, we were going to explain that Heavy Hitter Solo is, is only Heavy Hitter's cards. So if you want some of those, that little razzle-dazzle, rabbit-out-of-a-hat move, Lightning Press is the way to go. But we have seen how those cards have actually changed, uh, changed the complexity of turns, have changed and sort of caught players by surprise to devastating effects, being over-the-top, discarding cards, on-hit effects. So Lightning Press is something that you might not see, obviously, in traditional CC, but I think it's going to have a place in this particular match to maybe catch someone off guard and maybe swing the game in one way or another. Looks like we have a, a brief pause here with the players. We'll see what the discussion is <laughs> If, right. if we go back to 10 to 2, then maybe. <laughs> so what's great about this as well is having the players mic'd up. Now, they, are, they have noise canceling a little bit on their, on their headsets mm -hmm. just to stay focused, but also they can hear each other, which is great. Yep. And uh, again, it's Savage Feet, so you know we're going to be able to sort of peek into what's going on and what they're discussing, which is awesome. A mic token is uh, floating, but we'll give you a little bit more resolution as to what's going on. But as it stands, both players in good one, spirits. One both players having a, a good time. Yeah, and that's what I appreciate. We're playing for it today, right? The pressure's on. Okay. This, is, this is for all the marbles. And these two guys are still just having a great time. Very jovial with each other. You know, you can hear some of the table talk. Yes. There's a, uh, there's a saying in sports that, uh, right. that when you're a rookie, act like you've been there. So when you score your first goal, don't go crazy. Sure. Act like you've been there. And if there's anyone who's been there more than anyone, it's Kelvin Law and Brody Spurlock. Uh, both players are basically one and two in the uh, global XP rankings. Yep. And uh, uh, this pop Brody was honestly, like I said earlier, Brody was more excited about that one experience point on the line sure, yeah. <laughs> in this matchup. So we're back at it, friends. Everything's uh, all cleaned up. Calvin Law at 25 playing Betsy and Ko, yes. armed and dangerous, piloted by Brody Spurlock at 29. And this is one of the things I've enjoyed about this format is even on the off turns where, you know, I don't have a lot going on, we often see a seven power attack come out of the players. Clash of Might, the artwork inspired by when Craig and I decide where we're going for dinner. Oh, yeah. No, this is like, 
who gets to talk first when we sit down in the booth. <laughs> this is us fighting for who gets the right or left seat. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, another heavy hitters card, dual class, brute, and guardian. Basically, when it defends, clash with the attacking hero. The winner creates a might token, but this is coming in as an attack. So it's not defending, it's attacking. It had the might token to give it a little bit of a boost. Seven attack. Kelvin likes his hand here, going down to, uh, to 18. And, and, and there was an interesting line there where Brody used a piece of his equipment. He, he cashed it in to create an agility token for the next turn. And I believe he ended up arsenaling a No Fear, which is a, a new majestic for the brute players. Very powerful. Um, it, it, it reveals six power cards to prevent damage. And, you know, I think Brody's thought process is, I'm going to want this four-card hand and the agility token to make multiple attacks next turn, and I can soak up most of a big attack with this No Fear. Here is my spoiler card. This is the Good Time Chapeau. It is a Bessie specialization. Basically, you destroy a gold that you control, and Kelvin's in Scrooge mode. He's got a pile of it. Uh, destroying gold you control your next attack this turn will uh, wager, I believe it was. Yes. So we're going to wager a Vigor token here, the Good Time Chapeau. It's a Vigor and a Might from the hat. Just like, you know, you say rabbits out of a hat, kind of sort of similar thing. You're just pulling Vigor tokens, Might tokens, why not? Concuss, however, I'm very high on this card. I really like this card. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, what it does is, uh, on the surface, you know, it looks calm and ready, but you want to pump it up and get a little bit of that on-hit discard. This is a card that I think, in other formats, if you see this in a pummel together, you feel awful. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, Kelvin has, has basically pieced together a very powerful turn from all of these different parts where Concuss doesn't generally wager by itself, so he wouldn't be able to use the Betsy ability. But he's able to use the hat, cashing in a gold, to wager on this attack, and then he's able to use the Betsy ability, pumping the power on the Concuss, so now the Concuss has its on-hit ability, and, and it all works. Everybody talking about the uh, the party hat there being so good, not just for the fact of the it, when you use it, you don't break it. It doesn't bust up. You can use it multiple times if you have the goal to. But it's also a potential three block over yeah. over two blocks, which is incredible. I mean, the value off of a card like that is just unreal. At, at rare. At rare, at yeah. At rare. That blows my mind. Well, you know, that's what Brian was saying yesterday. I asked him, is there, was there an intention to actually scale down the rarity of these types of equipment. And he said, absolutely, this is something that we've wanted to do to sort of improve the draft and the, the limited experience so that players do have access to some better blocking ability and some of these more potent uh, equipment pieces as we see right there. That's the card that I love. This is a great card. This is Lunging Press. And many other players are, are going to laugh this off in other formats. But in this format, that card has done some work. In conjunction with Concuss, too. So it's, uh, yeah, let's talk about this. I mean, he is creating his own little garage sale of goodies <laughs> right over here. Yeah, because this is quite the collection, right? Oh, this is, we've got, so uh, you've got the, uh, you got the two gold tokens. So two gold tokens right here, again, which on the surface you pay two to draw a card, no problem. You've got the Might token right here that will bust at the beginning of the turn in order to give plus one. And finally, the Vigor token giving a little bit of a discount for those weapon swings. Lead with speed is opening up a non-attack action. Uh, Root or warrior attacks plus three, but it also automatically creates a agility token. Yeah, no, and this is gonna be another successful turn out of Brody where he's swinging an agility token into the next turn when he had already started with an agility and agility token in this turn. Uh, just just really powerful turn after turn out of both players. We see the life totals are very close. Uh, Kelvin has a little bit more resources to work with as far as his, his armor suit and, like you said, that, that whole collection of tokens there. Nine attack with the go again. Agility created, meaning the next turn cycle will also have a go again opening up if... You have cards. You never know. Kelvin might just want to lay it on thick and force Brody to block. But um, you and I were talking about potentially having opportunities today to play some of the sealed, the heavy hitter sealed. Yep. Lunging press is a card that I'm going to want. And okay. I, yeah. what, come hell or high water, I don't care if people are high on it, low on it. It's a card I want because nothing feels better than dropping a, a lunging press onto a concuss. That feels amazing to me. Okay. So, so if there's one in your pool, 
Uh, it's uh, what? Uh, yeah, if in, I have in one, your deck, no matter what, you're like I don't care how many majestics, legendaries, whatever. If I yep. have a lunging press and a concuss, we are on Betsy. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna close the chain. Here we go. So closing the chain over here. The go again has occurred. Kelvin down to eleven now, and he's gonna follow this up. So yeah. <laughs> okay, it was not a, a no fear. It's, it's a cast bones. That okay. was in his arsenal. All right. So what do we see here? Four might tokens. Kablamo, Kablamo, yes. Kablamo, and Kablamo. We've got four might tokens. And what a way to finish a turn, right? With, with no resources floating, able, able to swing all of this damage into the next turn. Yeah, well, you found him. And, and again, the might tokens are going to be brutal. Now, what's fascinating about cast bones and why I was mentioning in, a, in the wider CC pool of hitting six, you do get a bonus when yep. you do hit six. Yep. They just, it's kind of like a package deal, you know? It's like, well, listen, if you buy six, I'll throw in the agility shot. You got me. You know, fine, no problem. Well, I, what I think is funny about it is that if you hit six, yeah, you're yeah. at such a big advantage. And then they're like, no, no, we're going to give you a little more. Yeah. Like, we'll like, throw in the CD player if you buy the, if you, if you get the air conditioning. Like, you know? like did, did I really need the agility token once I got plus six attack on my next turn? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, boy. All right. So the four might tokens created by cast bones are just sitting on the board waiting. Kelvin Law at 11 cannot like to see that. Yeah. And, and another interesting aspect of, of the cast bones is that the cards then get shuffled and put back on top of the deck at random. So Kelvin has a very good idea of what Brody's hand is going to look like, but he doesn't know exactly what it's going to be. That's a very good point. You draw four, so uh, four of the six. So, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. Uh, well, through. that's the other, that's a very good point that uh, was just whispered into my ear by the brute master. That was uh, Ethan. Ethan mentioned, he's like, hey, yeah, uh, unless you roll knucklehead a six and you just draw all six cards. Yeah, but... The, the problem with this line of thought, right, the logic we're using here is that it's just as likely you roll a one on the knucklehead as it is you roll a six. Yeah, but we're not cowards here, baby. We roll sixes. That's what we do. That's what uh, the brutes do? Yeah, unless you're Heiner from, uh, from White Rabbit, who was oh, like, yeah. <laughs> but I think he squeezed all the ones out of the dice this weekend. We'll see how it goes. All right, so, uh, yeah, we saw the six cards. And, uh, you know, talking about what differentiates an average player from a good player, a good player from a great, great to elite... It's finding and maintaining that knowledge in your mind because you never know when those that 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 edge will help you out. Kelvin knows what those cards are. He knows that they're on top of the deck. He knows what Brody can potentially put piece together. Oh goodness me! So wow, wow! <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> so I mean, I would also cackle and laugh and have that kind of confidence if I was tossing in a 15-point wager the farm on this yeah, one. Yeah. And, and also, Kelvin found a good use for the gold where the... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the newest majestic here, but he's able to sacrifice a gold yeah. in, instead of paying the cost for it. So, bet big. There's the double down. That's what we're talking about. Uh, it's not just a KFC sandwich, man, but it's just as bad for your heart if you're Brody. Well, and, and the the bottom part of the double down, j just read that part for us. All right. If a hero would create one or more uh, one or more tokens from a wager that turn, instead they create that many plus one of each. So, I mean, we see that there's been three different tokens that have been wagered. Kelvin, if he sneaks damage through here, which he, it, it's looking pretty, pretty likely he will, he's going to end up with six tokens on it on the, his side of the board. Um, give some props here to Brody, who is under the thumb here of Betsy, who has honestly just put everything up, throw in, you know, the gold token, the the might token, the vigor token, threw it. I, I think my the keys to my Corolla are in there too. Sure. So I mean, why not? Everything's being bet on what is, and it's one of those things where, sure, you don't have the resources to overpower this, but I don't think you need to. Yeah. It, once you hit fourteen, fifteen power. You're not really worried about it. And on the other side, all of those might tokens, that agility token, if Brody decides that he can cover this with his hand, let's say he blocks out, he's getting zero benefit from all these tokens popping on his turn. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's one of those like very safe bets sometime where it's like, okay, 
if you give me four cards, I lose, those tokens evaporate. This is the perfect response to what Brody presented the previous turn. That cast bones creating four might tokens seems absolutely nasty. There's an agility token that could really extend that combat chain, especially when Kelvin is in a, in a precarious position down to 11. That's a dangerous number against the KO with that kind of setup for the follow-up turn. So what does Kelvin say? Let's play cards, baby. Let's play for all of it. Let's double down. Let's. Oh! Oh, <laughs> oh Craig. <laughs> I didn't name the cards. For those who can't see my face, it looks a little bit like this. <laughs> that is absolutely not what your face no, looks I'm, like. <laughs> I'm ecstatic. This has been such a great tournament with such great people and great players. I am I am having such a great time here, and these matchups have been exceptional. Yep. Um, the players in this particular matchup, Kelvin, Brody, they've been there, they've done that, but not in this capacity. Yeah, and... and like I said, you can see that they're having a good time, but they are uh, taking this yeah, serious. And then we clash for agility twice. Hmm. All right, double clash for agility. Oh, that's a whiff. So It's the uh, same card off the top, I believe, when you're clashing. It just goes off the top. Yeah, Brody's going to win both clashes, but he also already has an agility token. So he's going to have uh, runner, runner, runner uh, with the triple agility. Yeah, I'm not sure that's how that works. A total of nine? Hey. I'm not a doctor, okay? Yeah, 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 but you're certainly not a rules specialist either. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we will actually maybe get Josh Scott on today. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Josh has been very helpful over the past two days, clarifying some of the nuances of some of these new keywords like Clash and Wager. And uh, look at that, a pile of goodies here. This whole area, <laughs> right up here, we call this the bazaar. I, I mean, if Kelvin gets enough of these, does he send them out to get them graded? <laughs> You can get a dis. You can get like a like a bulk discount yeah. with PCG, yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh my goodness! Yeah, look at this board. <laughs> okay, so keep in mind, there's this, there's this. Uh, we're probably at a point where they're gonna start like uh, like migrating the game to our table here. <laughs> But this is what Heavy Hitters is all about. Look at the potential of what these heroes can do, the wealth that they're accumulating. It's very thematic, too. You go to the arena. You're wagering on your champion to go ahead and win those battles. And all Brody can do is swing in with Ball Breaker, with Go Again. Um, yeah, the Might Tokens again. Yeah, but... there, there are five Might Tokens, so it's pumping this up to eight power. It does have go again. Potentially, Brody could be, you know, pocketing a, a zero-cost attack here. But in general, when you're, when, when you're looking at the attacks that Kelvin is making, you wanted to have a better open than swing with my Ball Breaker. I... <laughs> keep, keep it together, Matt. We're good. This is going to be a we got, I, together. I still have the whole weekend to do so yeah. i'm gonna pace myself there's gonna be a lot of ball breakers this week yeah i'm gonna pace myself um <laughs> so as nasty as that attack was that kelvin put forth in response to brody's big turn eight go again when you're at 11 is no joke it's no joke but it's interesting because kelvin has so many free resources on the next turn where the, the vigor tokens are just going to float three at the start of his turn he can turn that three float into just extra cards through the gold. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like he has so many options here where he can block with, with one card, he can block with three cards, and through all of this, he could still have a very effective turn. Agree. Um, you're right. Uh, Vigor tokens in conjunction with gold tokens, you're seeing how the tokens themselves have been synergizing, not with just the constructed cards, but with themselves. Yeah. And... We said it earlier, Kelvin is still sitting on a good bit of armor in this game as well. Stonewall Impasse, Guardian Equipment. This is the offhand. So essentially, when this defends, you clash with it. Now, if you win the clash, it gets plus one. It has temper. So this is a conditional three block, and you have to win the clash. Kelvin uh, lost one of the clashes already, and up against a Brute, it's not a, it's not a sure thing. As, as much of a Guardian as you are, there's still opportunities for Brody to come out with some big attacks to actually win those clashes. Bigger than big is uh, going to be blocking here as well. The Stonewall Impasse is not going to be committed here. He hasn't committed to the block just yet, but he's going to use some of the equipment anyways. Protecting the life total, and I think that's prudent here. And I think what you can see here 
is that if you're using a lot of equipment, it's likely that Kelvin wants to hold cards to just no make use of this smorgasbord of, of tokens on the board. Yeah, yeah, he's going to have another big turn coming, and I'm, I'm excited to see what it's going to be. So getting use out of the equipment, the chapeau, you've got the arm pieces as well, a great new arm piece for Guardian. Yeah. And you and I were discussing, is it this? Is it Crater Fist? There's very circumstantial. This might be a, a sideboard option as well. I mean, it's a very cool card. So here we go. It is now to Kelvin. And all of these tokens on the bottom of the screen, everything but the gold, is going to evaporate. And, and you're not supposed to have this many resources to work with. Says who? <laughs> says who? Says the rules. <laughs> everything we know about the game says that this is not okay. <laughs> well, uh, Kelvin looks so stoic in this uh, in his spot here and he's uh, like we said the number one xp player you know he's played the game more than possibly more than anyone frankly and we've got uh i think brian said the only person who's played more than him is probably james yeah and yeah. the good time chapeau is going to come online sacrificing a gold to wager some more yeah and and again the the wager allows the that's the ability to be activated so I, I wouldn't say this is the flashiest possible turn, but still a, a very strong turn. Sure. I mean, let's be real. You, you did you just pay practically nothing to play Concuss? Yeah, he, he he's pitched a blue card, but he he's making this big nine power overpower attack, threatening to peel a card out of the opponent's hand. We we know that Brody is almost out of armor at this point in the game, and there's probably a, a hammer swing coming behind this. So uh, for those who are wondering what's uh, the sequencing here, well, frankly, you open up by having the Vigor Tokens pop, mm -hmm. gains your resources. So you had three floating. You move in with the Good Time Chapeau to make a wager sacrificing a gold piece. Yep. So you play the Concuss for effectively free. They were paid for by the Vigor Tokens. And now you're paying for the Betsy ability. So that's where the one blue pitch for all of this value has come from. And uh, it's going to get overpower, so it's going to be difficult to block. Yeah, that was a great synopsis. And, and we see the two, the Vigor and the Might token that are being wagered there from the hat. Nine from the Concuss. Now this is pod racing is an excellent, excellent... Uh, you love that reference. Oh. That's right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, and I agree with you, Jim Williams. This set does look incredibly fun. We got to play it. We got to see it in action. And we cannot wait for you to get your hands. Well, we did not get to play it. Well, we got to see it. And I feel like I'm kind of part I am of... jonesing so bad to I know. get into the game. I know. I am I am so excited to go, uh, you know, once uh, once Celebration was all wrapped up, we got the... We put the wreath on the dude uh, who wins. And when we get our chance to, to go amongst the masses and start heavy hitting ourselves, it's going to be great. You know why? Because I'm, I'm going to open three lunging presses the, the triple lunge that's the unfair pool that you're looking for that's what i want people are like give me like i got like a two majestics and a foil majestic and a legendary i'm, I'm like i got three lunging presses the, and the, the triple press and a yellow concuss that's all we need oh, well, are, yeah do you, so the block is going to be presented here oh and he does the nasty he manages to cut it up with a, a brand new majestic card here yeah, this is one that, that I thought was sticking around earlier. Yeah, no fear. I mean, go for it. This was a card that you thought was in the Arsenal, a great Arsenal card as well. But this is a way, Craig, to circumvent the overpower. Yeah, it, it's an instant, so it doesn't count as a, an action when you're, you're using it. And it says when you play it, it's going to prevent two damage plus an additional two damage for each six power card you banish from your hand. And then at the end of the turn, the banished cards go back to your hand. So Kelvin Law actually gave a little round of applause to Brody yeah. for managing to dance around what was a brutality of a turn there. And now Brody is going to be able to make use of uh, some cards left in hand to make an 11. <laughs> Why not? Look Why at not? these turns. It's incredible to see because even with limited resources, you know, with limited cards in hand, you're still able to weave together this kind of masterpiece of just tossing an 11 there. Why not? And uh, you might hear it in the background there. We're kicking off the celebration. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, uh, so it's James giving a speech out there to sort of kick off this. Uh, I'll, I'll be right back. I want to hear this. Craig, 
you leave, <laughs> you, you don't want to fly this baby solo? No, I can't land this one, my friend. I mean, the, the attacks are too high. The drama is too thick. No, that is fair. Plus, uh, I need someone to keep me in check so I can do things like this. You know, I need someone to keep me grounded. All right, as long as you're not focused too much on the card names, I think we'll be okay. Haven't even referenced it, but it does look like Brody took the midnight train to pound town on this oh, one. Oh, there it is. An 11 attack out of nowhere, practically, is going to be threatening Kelvin Law for lethal. This is in a situation where you can just let it fly. You have to respect this to a degree. The beat chest ability, all that jazz, a might token uh, can be created... Uh, if you've beaten chess, but I don't think Brody had the cards in hand in order to nope. be able to do that. But it's cool because it's an optional, right? Many brute cards of the past were, as an additional cost, discard a, you know, discard a card. This is just you may. Yeah, you, you can get that little extra bonus if you've got the the additional cards in your hand. And we know that the bonus is almost compounded with the KO ability because when you discard for the beat chest ability, you're getting the might token there, but KO is also going to provide you another might token. I mean, all of these cards have just been so tall, so devastating. You know, Pound Town in the Pound District, frankly. Yep. Uh, of the Pound region. Yes. Massive. Just so good. These Part cards of Pound are City. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Within yeah. the, you know, exactly. Um, the card names have been unique. They've been excited. They've, They're they've so been fun. fun. They They're are. They're so fun. I mean, you've got, you have like the, the just the, the, the brutal, the, 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 the beat chest, the pound town, the ball breaker, but then you have like the more gambling esque, uh, yeah. like the runner runner, the double down, put your money where your mouth is, cut the deck, cut the deck. Yeah, the theme and the naming of the cards have been exciting as well as it just kind of puts you in the the mindset of being in that arena, of watching your champion go, of you know betting behind uh, on your champion and seeing if they can actually convert here. So. Uh, and and we see Kelvin just being so careful here. I, I I think he's just a touch frustrated that you know not only was Brody able to cover his great attack on the previous turn, but then he's able to answer back on his own turn with an eleven to power attack and agility token that'll swing over to the next turn. And you know I I think Kelvin felt like he had grabbed the reins in this game. And a after this, I'm not so sure. Well, that's precisely it. Typically, if your opponent manages to go away or like walk away scot-free from a massive turn usually they're left with nothing yeah so you get to draw up and try to give it another go this is the opposite brody was able to sort of sidestep a freight train and then still throw rocks at it okay go to one all right so wow Calvin is playing the game here yes th this and i'm i'm pretty shocked by this because Brody is at such a high life total. I, I don't think Kelvin could threaten, you know, the, the, the knockout punch this turn. Well, you got you came as close as you can get, as you can hear Ko just smelling blood here, and he knows that he's so close. But we can, we have seen how these players are playing, playing for keeps. They want to throw big attacks. They want to make him uncomfortable. And now we're betting big again. So, is that another double down? into a bet big? Yeah, I, I mean, we see the wager happening. I don't believe we have a Betsy ability here. No Betsy ability. Um, I think you had to, I, a card had to be tossed in front of the previous uh, attack. So, I mean, had you kept that card, you could have done it. So I think that's when we were talking about Kelvin being so kind of disturbed by that particular attack. It's because it was, it was, it was lethal. Kelvin may have thought, you know, if this was, uh, if this was anything but lethal, I would have taken it and I would have come back with this, with the Betsy ability. But he had to give up a card here. So Kelvin now with eleven, no Betsy ability, so no overpower on this. But eleven is an awkward number. You don't have any equipment now. Brody has just tossed close to the wind here, uh, and he's just thinking. So again, the stress on these both on both these players, as fun as this event has been up to now, it's. These types of turns where, once again, you're reminded what's on the line. Yeah, they're feeling it here. And, uh, and you know, Brody's got to evaluate how effective his hand is with that agility token on the board because he still has a pretty healthy life total to use as a resource in this situation. He can say, I don't care about giving you some tokens if I'm just taking your hand, you know, every turn for the rest of the game until you die. Um, but, but if Brody's hand isn't very good, maybe he says, you know, I, I want to cover this one. I want the tokens, and then 
you know, we'll continue playing it out from this favorable, favorable position where I'm at 15 and you're at one. Brody has been uh, very resilient, has been very adept at kind of squeaking out of some very tight situations over here, and the attacks have been tall. They've been significant. They've had on hits. This wager on the double down into the bet big is, I mean, I want to just uh, also note that it was very early in this game that Kelvin created three gold. He's down to one. He's used the chapeau, which wants the gold options uh, twice already. Yep. He's generated more gold. He's he could draw cards. You do So the the significance of gold in uh, the significance of the gold uh, has been just very important in terms of um, you know improving future attacks, the significance of those attacks, the implications of those attacks. So that gold early on has really played dividends for Kelvin Law. But Kelvin here, no more margins for error. 11, uh, 11 power here is not going to break Brody, but it is going to create another slew of these tokens. Oh, so uh, I got to double, double check here. Right, so new cards, Craig, yep. and uh, we're going to make some mistakes uh, on some of them, but double down does grant overpower. So um, you could destroy a gold to pay the cost, but still the, the wagers and the plus three, gaining the, uh, gaining the overpower from double down. Still learning here again. Yeah, yeah, and, and new cards, all, new experiences. All, yep, yep. all of these wagers are now going to get doubled up by the double down. So just it's just a huge turnout of Kelvin, and we'll see if Brody is able to threaten enough to where Kelvin can't take advantage of all of these free resources. And once again, you got to get money to make money, and here it is: three more golds, runner, runner, two might tokens, two vigor tokens. So you're going to get plus two on your attack. You're going to get two free resources just for walking through the door. You got gold falling out of your pocket. Kelvin's got to feel good. The only issue is he's at one life. Yeah, that one life total is, is big. We'll see if Brody's got, you know, the, the the runner runner into the ball breaker turn or if he's got something else in his pocket that he's going to deploy here. Runner runner six go again. Again, it creates another agility off of its own go again. Into potentially ball breaker. Now, there was no discard from what I understand. Nope. So ball breaker is just going to be a three. Yeah. Right? So so Kelvin can block very clean. You know, two cards on this, one card on the ball breaker. If that is the attack, uh, I will just arsenal. I like this play by Brody actually, because I think that two cards can't, isn't going to ruin Brody's day. But I think what Brody is thinking here is, if I'm going to cross this finish line, I need a five card hand to pretty much seal the deal. I mean, you can do it with four. But I think what Brody is thinking here is let's just put this in the pocket. Let's grab four more cards. You're at one. Let's make a turn with very awkward, weird numbers that are going to peel the cards away. I think if Brody can string together, you know, a seven and a four or, you know, three separate attacks, that is a complete possibility here. You can do attack into something like Wild Ride, into Ball Breaker, yeah. and that might get you there. A hundred percent. I just don't know if... Like, once you leave Kelvin with, with multiple cards in his hand, multiple gold tokens, all of these free resources, I don't think you're going to be able to go back to your turn with a five-card hand. He's going to present an attack like this, coming in for 10, that is going to force Brody to, to commit multiple cards to blocking it. It's not just the might that is being wagered over here. It's the fact that this is in conjunction with Betsy's ability. That has been put online. It has been paid for. And again... You got the free pass from those Vigor tokens? This was an absolute mistake, tell, telling you that the Telestrator was working. I'm just, you know. You're, you're having a ball here. I'm a, uh, and don't break it. <sighs> Th that is fair. That is fair. Don't break it. Listen, you, you, you are a Michelangelo. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I was more of a Donatello guy. I liked the, he was more of That's the, where know, we're going with used this. Used the bow staff sure. and stuff. I thought, you know, he was kind of. It kinda... does look like you're trying to draw with the bow staff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that like the 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 two days of getting used to me. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, are you are you there yet? Yeah, we're starting to reach the limit. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, it's it's you know equal both ways, right? Like, oh, I, Craig, I love you, man. You know that. So, <laughs> I, you know, we rarely get to work together. So the fact that we get like a five pack. Oh, this is yeah, yeah, just a ball. So ten attack here. It is overpowered. It's a ball and. 
a ball breaker. So we're going to clash. It's a win for Brody. Uh, can I, I'm sorry, can I see? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very astute there. Brody wants to make sure that he knows what the card is on the top. Yep. Okay, so I'm blocking four. So it is a block card, which was essentially the only way he could have got out of this. Oh, wow. And another no fear. Oh, the perfect time for this one, huh? And this is this tells exactly why he arsenaled the card last turn. Brody. Brody, Kel Kelvin came all the way out here. Okay. And all you're doing is ruining this party. No, I, I love it. One, like, Kel like, Kelvin, the first time that he had this massive attack and Brody stuffed it, Kelvin gave him an applause. Like, you know what? Good job, kid. Like, that was really exciting. Now he's like, I am going to just... Yeah, well, one point did leak. You know, Kelvin ended up winning his wager here. Uh, he did, right? I mean, but the fact is, is that would have... That, that went from being the kill shot to, uh, hey, I'll let you have a mic token. <laughs> and look at the cards that he has left. All right, so Bear Fang is going to discard a card. So this is going to be seven go again, and I get a mic token. Look at that. Oh, wow. Seven go again. What did I say? If you can pair together a seven and a four, you're likely going to get there. There is one bastion of hope here. Yep, it's the hat. It's the... Good times, chapeau, which has one more piece of block on it. The party hat is still ready to party. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Bear Fangs here did find the discard where needed, so it's going to find a plus two value for a seven go again off of the previous turn's agility. A might token was created for a follow-up turn, oh, the but the six was discarded, Craig, Yep. which means that ball breaker is coming in for four, another break point, and that chapeau is so keen. Yeah, I think we're going to have to see Kelvin put, you know, two, three blocks plus the hat in front of this one. Potentially a four block, one of the block cards, plus a three armor. And, and that'll leave him, you know, a card in his hand after he blocks out the ball breaker as well. So we'll, we'll see what happens here. Kelvin's opinion of Brody as a player is just rising. His, his opinion of a friend has just kind of, those stocks have tanked. I will send four. And the four with the ball breaker, that's game. Wow. Oh. Unreal. And, and Kelvin, just I know the no turn after game. turn of, of these just spectacular attacks out of Kelvin. And, and Brody just able to use every single piece of his board. It, you know, the agility tokens, the might tokens. We see him just with no armor left at the end of the game and just squeaks out the win. So we can hear from Brody, but let's hear from KO. Can we hear from KO here? He's having a ball. Absolutely. Breaker. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me grief about using these terms. It's all good. They're great terms. Not going to lie. It's made for a very exciting and fun weekend here, uh, or week here in Queenstown. Again, the calling is going to kick off tomorrow. The, the, you know, the, the big grand opening, as it were, of heavy hitters, the launch party is happening here as well. We'll be here for the whole thing. We will be here for the whole thing. It will all be broadcast. Savage Feats is going to bring you all of the jam walking through the crowd here. We had to kind of run in, get into the studio and such, but there are a lot of familiar faces of people that I've seen who've flown out, not just from like, you know, around the area, um, legendary caster Casanova is here and is playing with great people and from other games and Michael Fang made the yep. trip as he normally would and an incredible tournament game one in the books Brody Spurlock has the advantage I mean imagine you travel all the way here to play in the calling Kelvin or Brody have just taken down the the celebrational they're going to get a card made with their likeness on it and then you get paired against them <laughs> in true. round one of the calling yeah yeah it's, it's just like and it's uh, he's like, oh, so like, have you enjoyed? Uh, oh yeah, I've enjoyed it. I've been just the uh, you know beaten face and chest yeah. like all weekend long, you know. So it's been incredible. You're totally right. So we did find out here the next format, Craig. Okay, Living Legend. Yes, Living Legend. And uh, it was Kelvin's decision because he did lose that game. Okay, so he has decided to go uh, to go with the Living Legend format, and. Uh, it might be a situation where you're like, okay, you just beat the crap out of me with these super tall attacks. I'm going to go call a friend named Starvo and just, you, you, you think you know Pound Town? Welcome to 
the elements, my friend. Sure, yeah. This is going to be exceptional, and you are very curious about this because I also am curious about this because it's not just Starvo versus Prism, Starvo versus Chain. This is Starvo versus Lexi. Yeah, I, I literally have not seen this before, and you know, we, we've said it all week. Starvo's been scaled back. It's it's been nerfed. It's not as strong as it used to be, but it it, it still did very well in our, our event this week, and we see it here in the finals. So it's going to be interesting to see. You know, the, the slightly scaled back Starvo against more recently hitting Living Legend status Lexi, which, I mean, for me, Lexi has this unique ability to both present very big turns, output a ton of damage, but also have disruptive turns, which a lot of the decks that we see in Living Legend only do one or the other. And uh, we will be getting to that shortly. We're going to take a brief break as the players take a breather here, get their Living Legends decks out of the bag. And again... Round one, it's only one round, but it's game two of a best of three. Living Legend returns here after this short break. It's day three of the Celebrational. Be right back.
first one was one hell of a match here, and that was the solo CC heavy hitters, which was won by Brody Spurlock in spectacular fashion and nail biter. Now we're going to Living Legend. Uh, yeah, uh, that match was so good. It was exceptional. The players here obviously had that wonderful trophy to play for. The bragging rights of being, you know, the the first celebrational champion, the one XP, obviously. But, <laughs> but beyond that, we get a uh, the the legacy cemented in the form of making your own card with your likeness in it. Let's talk about Kelvin's card. Yeah, th this card was pretty interesting when it got previewed to us. Um, I I don't think it's as flashy as some of the other cards. But I really appreciate that he, he's used, you know, what I would call good mechanics here. He hasn't gone overly complicated, and it, it, it's a card that could definitely see play. Oh, this card would absolutely see play. This would actually perhaps get me back into playing Katsu again. Oh, I yeah? think that this is certainly a card that I know I would be interested in. Friends like Doa, who's a huge, huge ninja pl player, would love to see a card like this. So what is it? Thoughtful Gust Wave is a zero-cost red pitch, three attack, Three block ninja attack action. Combo. Combo card. That's very important. If a card with wind in its name was the last attack on this combo chain, it, this card gets plus one attack. Go again. Standard fare. Yep. But this is the juicy part. When this hits a hero, destroy all cards in their arsenal. All cards. Well, yeah, there, very few are going to run two these days, unless this is, you know, like Lexi and Living Legend. But still, uh, any time that you have a, this would hit a break point of four, and then you're threatening that arsenal, and you know all the, you know, the nasty little tricks that ninjas have with ancestral empowerment, maybe the return of something like uh, Razor Reflex or such, or Lunging Press. There you go. I think that you're totally right. It's the, the dichotomy between... Brody's, uh, um, you know, memoirs that he wrote yes. and thoughtful gust wave there. This is a card that I think is right in the wheelhouse of what could actually be a something printed in a set. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's an interesting card. And I, I think as far as power level, like you said, it, it kind of hits that sweet spot where it would see play, but it's not over the top bonkers. So, yeah, a, a great card. Thoughtful gust wave. Very thoughtful when he made it. There you go. Perfect. So let's talk about the uh, formats that we're playing right here, mm -hmm. right now, um, and the decks that are being represented. Again, Brody um, was the number one seed. Yes. Brody decided to go with heavy hitter solo first. That was his right as the number one seed to make that decision going second. He won on KO, defeating Kelvin Laws Betsy. Kelvin, as the loser in the first game of this best of three, has decided he wants to go and make our day and say, let's Living Legend. Yeah, this is the matchup we wanted to make sure that we saw. So having a second guarantees that we, we just get all of the fun that we want to have. Uh, I, I do think it's interesting that first match was so close. And it, it, is there a psychological advantage? Like, you know, Brody picks that match as the one he's the most confident in, the, the heavy hitter solo classic constructed match. If he had lost that, does it give Kelvin just a little bit extra edge going through these other two matches. Well, it's it's always, obviously, you want to win all your games, but of course. you do have that kind of safety net of saying, all right, you know what, like, I'm kind of glad that this is the Living Legend, that Living Legend is the second the second matchup here, because Lexi into Starvo is not an easy matchup. Lexi is not known to have an equipment set to sort of cover breakpoints, those dominate effects. You don't have that. Yeah, the damage output, the on hits, the disruption is there, but it's not easy. And I asked Brody uh, about his experience of Lexi into Starvo. He played three games yesterday in Living Legend. Okay. He had one loss okay. to Prism. Oh. He had one game against Starvo and one. So he's only got one rep into it in this tournament uh, situation, but now he's up against Kelvin Law, and Kelvin just got absolutely throttled by a lot of big KO attacks, and now he's ready to return the favor. Sure. All right, so the players are ready to rock and roll. It is the second game of the best of three. Kelvin Law versus uh, Brody Spurlock. Kelvin has decided to go second here. Yeah, you you often decide to go second when you're playing Starvo. Um, it's going to be interesting because that, that gives Brody the option for the, the ultimate setup turn, as it were. You double Arsenal and just pass. You don't even make an attack. You don't let the opponent sculpt their hand at all. And then you say... All right, whatever you have on your next turn, that's fine. I'm going to overpower it with a six-card hand on my turn. 
Well, the other option here is that if you're going second as Kelvin Law, depending on the, the, the caliber of player you're up against, some of them will attack, and it allows you to trade, like, block and, and, and filter out the cards to find that Starvo. Mm -hmm. If you've got, you know, two Earth and two Ice, you're looking for that Lightning card, you yep. might block with two in order to have two more kicks at the can to find it. But I think it's not just the fact that it's Lexi who wants to load arrows and pass. I think it's just that Brody is completely aware of that fact, that there's a good situation here that he might just not want to give Kelvin the opportunity to uh, filter the hand. So absolutely, Brody here looking to, to hope... Uh, Hoping here that Kelvin draws a, an abysmal hand, you know, maybe you get like two or three Winter's Bites and 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 some other nonsense that's not really going to help you out here. So we'll see how this goes. But I caught up with Brody in the hallway for two seconds, and I said, just want to ask you real quick. This seems, I don't want to say like a mismatch, but this seems like a, a very tall hill to climb if you're Lexi. What sure. is your strategy? He said, nine Winter's Bites, because his objective here is to keep Kelvin on one less card as much as possible so that even if he does have the fuse he's either going to have fuse swing hammer and give up an arsenal or fuse and not swing hammer for the arsenal he wants to sort of keep kelvin as uncomfortable as possible keep him as pared down in terms of hand size as possible that is the strategy he's going to be utilizing here and, and that's some great insight that you got from brody um because he he can be cagey with these winter bites as well, where he he can open with a go again attack. If Kelvin defends with any of the cards from his hand, now a winter's bite represents peeling him down to two cards. And we all know it's very hard to fuse and make an attack off of two cards. So the forgotten ice hero, Starvo. Everybody forgets that this is an ice hero. Um, everybody talks about Icelander, Lexi, Oldham, and, mm -hmm. you know, Frostbites are everybody's, uh, everybody's worst nightmare. But Starvo, Starvo brings it all. So here we go. Again, it's going to be Lexi Livewire, Brody up one nothing in this best of three. Winner gets the celebrational title, the trophy, the card, and that coveted one XP point. Yeah, that one XP... It it's funny because, you know, we're joking about it a lot and it, it seems so inconsequential. But I, I think catching Kelvin really does drive Brody where, where that, that is a, a big hill to climb for him. And, and, and ascending that hill and, and being on the pinnacle is part of what makes him, you know, show up with, with nine winter's bites and, and think about this and kind of skip some of the activities that we're doing. So he makes sure that he's ready for the next day's games. And, I, I, I love seeing that drive out of someone that's, you know, he's already so talented. He, he's, he's arguably the best person in the field here this, this weekend. And he's still saying, no, I need to put in the work in order to get what I'm, I'm trying to attain. And I'm very lucky I get to see Brody at many events and seeing him play. And he's, he's always been driven. He's always been motivated. He's always been there to play to win because he does want to get that, that, that XP. I don't have the same relationship or, or, or with Kelvin, but my guess is if Brody's starting to approach, this has to light a fire under Kelvin to say, you know, to maintain that title. So this is a very cool rivalry between the two players here as Brody has been very vocal that that is his, that is his goal. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, the flip side of that is Kelvin is the global XP leader by such a wide margin. He, he's clearly already showing up with a fire all the time, right? He's playing in tons of events. He's winning tons of matches and it, I don't expect him to slow down anytime soon. Brody now on the play here as he has Voltaire loaded up, Lexi Livewire, Quiver of Abyssal, uh, sorry, that's Quiver of Rustling Leaves. Yep. The Rustling Leaves. So you show up, you've got your, you got your hood, your, your bracers, you've got your Snapdragon scalers, you got this bow that fires lightning and you got a bag of leaves. There's nothing wrong with a bag of leaves. Not in this case. I mean, to be fair, you, you rarely dip into the bag of leaves. No, usually it's there. You throw them on the curb at the, at the end of October. <laughs> well, yeah, and that might be what happens to them this game, where it's just like, <laughs> ah, I didn't need them. I, I think the interesting equipment piece here is the bullseye bracer, because uh, it, it's a card that you weren't able to play with Lexi for a long time, because it is such a powerful effect in many situations. 
Arctic Incarceration is probably one of the few cards that he was willing to play early on. He's going to load up a red drill shot. Arctic Incarceration Red is such an incredible card. It just drops three Frostbites. It says your next turn is going to be expensive. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the perfect opening for Brody where, you know, we said that he was going to want to double Arsenal to set up the six-card hand. But on top of that, he was actually able to put some disruption on the board without attacking and we said that attacking was just such a bad idea because it would allow kelvin to sculpt his hand well three frostbites it, it could be a big deal here so we're going to open up with a winter's bite you got to pay for this one typically it's that card is free but uh you got to think if the tables are turned here if if that wasn't if that was a red winter's bite instead of a red arctic incarceration Brody probably wouldn't have played it. Uh, this is a, a nice ideal turn. There's no Sarvo Fuse, but what this card does here, Winter's Bite, is going to require Brody to pay one or discard a card. And Brody knows that um, this is a situation he's seen Winter's Bites before. Winter's Bite's a card that uh, some Lexis used to play. So in that meta where Lexis were very abundant, um, Brody is very familiar with evaluating the cards and knowing what to pay through the Winter's Bite for. And Winter's Bite is, is one of those, you know, generally you're using this to fuse and pitch, but in the turns where you don't have your Starvo ability online, it allows you to make multiple plays in the turn. So Kelvin is going to be pitching a Winter's Bite here, another one, in order to go ahead and swing the Frost Hammer. That's Winter's Whale. It's going to have a Frostbite Chaser associated with it. Four is the damage, and Brody, happy to sign for it. He's going to get a Frostbite token as well, and that is going to basically tax the net the first action he takes by an additional one so still managing to leak damage or get through with some damage get a little disruption effect uh kelvin may not have wanted to to sort of have a, a sort of so-so turn early but he may not have had the pieces to fuse he may not have had it so making the best of a bad situation here's that strategy that we're talking about brody wanting to buy cards out of kelvin on his turn and a red winter's bite is one hell of a way to do it he's running all nine so so the red winter's bites are, are particularly good because it will always cost a full blue pitch card in order to pay for this the the blues and the yellows are a little bit interesting because Oftentimes, Kelvin wants to use his crown of seeds anyway. So if you Winter's Bite him and he pitches a blue to pay for it and still has resources floating, he can still, you know, pay for the crown of seeds without sucking up an extra card. Yeah, and you're not at the tunic point yet where you can rely on on uh, your chest piece to sort of pay through some of it. But he's going to go ahead and toss an evergreen yep. to pay it. And uh, yeah, Red Winter's Bite is probably the ideal opener here for Brody. He's going to follow up with three of a kind. Love it. I kind of took a peek there quickly at uh, Ethan. Ethan has so many really cool sound bites, okay. some of which are Lexi-esque. It's going to happen. I, I'm confident that we're going to hear some sound bites, but none for three of a kind. I wouldn't even know what three of a kind sound bite would be. You are making promises over here, my friend. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming that it's going to happen. Stay tuned. If you've been a fan of Savage Feats, if you've watched the production, which I know you have and you adore it, you know what's coming. For yep. those who don't, yep. You'll see. It's a treat. It is definitely a treat. A little added, uh, little kind of, you get you get a treat for all the senses. We're we actually. Don't talk about Starvo. There it is. I remember when I was in the studio recording that. They're like. It's oh, you're the one singing there. 17 takes. Yeah. 17 takes. Wow. Yeah. Then they kicked me out and got, got hurt, but it's all good. Oh, that wasn't you. That was not me. I thought no. you had a wide range. I do. Yeah. But that's my. That's that's not singing's not my thing. Uh, Ethan's actually working on uh, adding smell to the broadcasts. We're not sure the technology's <laughs> there yet, but uh, yeah. All right. So drill shot has a lot of implication here. Uh, drill shot is gonna if it does leak through, it's gonna put a minus one counter on some of the equipment. And I mean, you've got equipment that blocks. You've got the crater fist, the civic steps, and the final spring tunic. So there are options here for drill shot. Yeah, th this is a little bit interesting. It looks like Brody's draw from the three of a kind wasn't as good yeah look at this it looks like three non arrows still in his hand so you know he's very considerate about it he doesn't want to give away that he doesn't have another arrow coming here but you know if, if i'm in brody's spot I, I i've lived through this right like all of us lexi players have where you've got the he had a five card hand coming into the turn plus the three of a kind an arrow already rolled up and you know the three of a kind just wasn't kind to him this time
So blocking the four from the drill shot, actually putting the crater fist in front of it there, just kind of preventing it. If, if you let it leak, it's going to get the, the minus one counter anyways. Now, the beauty here is that Kelvin's thinking, okay, three of a kind turn. This is going to be gross. Uh, it's going to be a three, hour uh, a three arrow turn. But Brody did not find no the magic recipe. So no reaction skin, going through all the little steps here, being very deliberate about everything, all the phases, getting through it. Kelvin here is, you can see he's pensive. He's like, what is the follow-up? I see one drill shot, I see another. That's the bread of this uh, crap sandwich that he's gonna eat here. Sure. But he doesn't know what's in between. And if you're asking Brody, probably ham. Well, and, and now Brody's question is, do I just arsenal and pass here, right? Like, like he has the option of following this up with another arrow attack, that, that, but then he won't have as effective of a turn next turn. Sorry, we, we just got a little bit distracted now. When After this Ethan change. always surprises us with cool sound effects, and we saw yesterday yeah. that there was some that I wasn't sure. I honestly thought that there was like a shuttle launch going on or something else, but now there was a, a little light rumble and I kind of looked at Ethan, and Ethan's like, that one wasn't me. So I don't know if we're directly under an airport. Yeah. It seems, okay. seems like we're in a flight path here. Yeah, but it's uh, about every, like, five minutes or so, you get a little shake and rattle. But here we go. Dude, the bag of leaves. We got the bag of leaves. And did we find a little little yeah, helpful yeah. Uh, nugget? We did. It's a blue Bolton shot. Not the ideal, but it did. It was certainly helpful. So is this a Snapdragon turn here, to, or do you just keep the Bolton in there? I mean, you could always just draw up to something like a Rain Ra uh, sorry, a Rain Razors to maybe find it, but finding having a Bolton shot that wasn't loaded for a plus value can be cumbersome. Yeah, so I think the last card in Brody's hand here is another three of a kind. Yeah. So we're going to see him just arsenal this card and, and pass, and, you know, basically he's saying, I'm going to do the same thing again next turn, but hopefully with much more success. And it's a three of a kind on a Tunic turn. So Brody does have the capacity to actually block some of the attacks that are coming through. Sure. So another drill shot, just kind of pestering Kelvin here to just bring in some of the equipment to block. The Crater Fist is locked up here, however, so you can't block with that again. So we're curious. I mean, it, it's, it's not a three block plus the second block of Crater Fist. It's a three block plus going over the top with Civic Steps. And then if you do hit Civic Steps, suddenly your Bolton shot gets the free go again, and you got to feel good about that. Yeah, if you're Kelvin, if you have your Fuse already rolled up here, you're saying, man, I really don't want to block with one of the cards from my hand, but I also don't want to use my armor in this situation. The, the flip side of that is you, you are just so incentivized to cover this drill shot because putting a minus one counter on these two, two defense armors represents so much value too much value to give up at this point in the game and here so here are the civic steps that were from round the table and this uh, when the card lists were announced guardians rejoiced they had an incredible uh foot piece some were like oh do we really want to give quicken tokens away if you're talking about liability of quicken tokens i think that lexi is probably suited to benefit from them the most and there's Getting a free arrow that you don't need to load, having a Quicken token is incredible. So Kelvin is going to be incredibly calculated about when he tosses the boots into the ring. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because the Quicken token means that that arrow, if they load with Voltaire, they now can choose the plus one power ability because the attack's already going to have go again from the Quicken token. So you, the extra block that you're getting out of the Civic Steps, you're basically giving back to them on a future turn. So just swinging with the Ice Hammer, Winter's Whale, arguably one of the most powerful weapons ever printed. I'd put it up there against Voltaire. I'd put it up there against Rosetta Thorn. It's an incredible piece that these, uh, these Guardians relied on. Star uh, Starvo loves to have it. Insidious Chill pitched away for it. How, how do you think it matches up with Duskblade? If we ever see it played. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. I, I put you in a bad spot there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't have had an answer either. It's like it's asking me, like, wh like what the rocks on Mars taste like. Like, how the hell am I supposed to know? Yeah, what do those taste like, Flay? Cheese. <laughs> Jeez. So there's the Frostbite threatening in tow for attack. And, I mean, this is just the power of this card. You're Like, the Guardian Hammers are, you know, mostly fours, and, like, that's what you're getting with him. Anathos has a base four uh, with some upside. Titan's Fist is a little more tricky. But this one was so nasty because the break point that was always there, plus the threatening of the of the frostbite, ruined so many days for so many so for so many months in the meta. Um, 
Tales of Aria, practically almost all, all the heroes have LL'd. A lot of those cards are basically rotated out only LL legal. And Winter's Whale is a is a is one of the, the sort of one of the cards I mourn the most. Okay. It, it was kind of the jewel of what you enjoyed playing with. It was. Yep. And I mean I love Guardian. I love Oldham. I love control. I love you know, ice mechanics have always been like my my uh I, I've always played ice type decks in most other games. You know, Frost Mage and World of Warcraft or this or that. I was always the ice guy, the control guy. So Winter's Whale, Oldham, that kind of stuff was very much up my alley. And uh I was very lucky a buddy of mine, uh Barrett Goss, actually got me a cold foil Winter's Whale as a thank you for introducing him to the game. So I'm just waiting for LL format to start you know, bubbling up more often so I can bust that bad boy out. You want to deploy your big frosty hammer? I do. Yeah. And it's a one-handed. You want to hear a cool story? Dale and Mac, when, uh, when we were, were back when, the, when Prism was legal, Starvo, et cetera, was having trouble with the Prism matchup. So he would use time skippers. He tried this out. I yep. played Prism. Time skippers, double hammer. And blink. And blinks and yep. stuff. So he and you just picture he's just like whipping it around and stuff like that. It just was hilarious to me to think about. But it was definitely an option here. So the frost hammer, an endless arrow tossed in front. The frostbite resolves, and uh, one more damage for Brody Spurlock. But in the, the strategy, you know, Brody talking about I want to peel cards out with things like uh, with things like um, you know the winter's bites, etc. But also one of those strategies you can employ is just being relentlessly. Uh, um, aggressive with yeah. on hits. Well, and, and I think last turn was a pretty disappointing turn for him. Like to see. But he uh, did force Kelvin to block with, a, you know, an earth and a lightning card, and then Kelvin used an ice card to swing with the hammer. So he was rolled up with that fuse, but he was just pressured too much, and he had to block with them. And we see another three-of-a-kind turn back-to-back -back here for Brody. And this one, I would guess, is going to have even more pressure than the last one. It, it's pretty doubtful that he's just going to whiff and, and not draw any arrows again. So, it, it, you know, Brody's going to be playing from the front foot. You know, we see the, the life total is 35 to 40, but that's not the story here. It, it's the opportunity that Brody's in right now to just be firmly in the, the driver's seat of this game. Kelvin's eventually going to have to make more complicated decisions or more, more um, sort of uh, agonizing decisions once he finds one of those, those sort of jewels of the deck, like Crippling Crush, Starstruck, or uh, Oakenold. Once he finds those and Brody becomes m c continues the aggression that's when you're like okay do I want a blood rot or do I want to attack do I want this frostbite or do I want to attack that's when it becomes more nasty the, it, a lot of these arrows have devastating on hits and I mean no one knows that better than you right here I mean yep. let's be real in these in those scenarios it must feel good when your opponent really values their hand because it kind of gives you that green light but and, and to that point I think that's why we see Kelvin playing so conservative early on in this game. He's saying, sure, I, I have a fuse. I could make a nine attack and a hammer, but this is not the good turn that I need to take over the game. It's just some damage. So I'm going to preserve my life total to make sure later when I do have that, that high impact attack, I have the life total to work with. Is that a sleep dart? That is a sleep dart. So tailoring your deck for the meta, that's what the pros do. Sleep dart feels like a good one. Yeah, it's a little bit interesting because a sleep dart works whether they block it or not, right? Like, if you put multiple cards in front of this, you're not going to be able to use your hero ability. And if you just let the damage leak through, you're not going to be able to use your hero ability. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I mean, Brody here, having a quick swig of water here, rehydrating, important. But what's also important is the fact that he feels a little bit more comfortable. He feels a little bit more at ease at this point because that sleep dart is, like you said, a, a very tough pill to swallow for Kelvin Law. And this is game two of the best of three, the finals of the Celebrational here in Queenstown. We have the, uh, the first ever heavy hitters gameplay going on just a couple meters away. Oh, this is, okay, so this just came through the pipeline, yeah, Craig. Th this is a juicy little tidbit. So... Do you remember uh, Tales of Aria's launch party, like the the big world premiere? Yep. When uh, what was it, Corsham? When Corsham yep. was was opened up, it was opened up for the first time at the world premiere. It was a, everybody in the hall, hundreds of people celebrated. The, that player, 
It was just like yeah, such a, yeah, a, an it, incredible moment. A party. There's hundreds of players out there opening boxes, packs for heavy hitters sealed. No one opened the uh, the fabled yet. It is still a mystery right now. We promise you, as soon as somebody opens it, we will bring you that coverage. We will get that person here. We will wrestle them to the ground, and we will take that card to show you. Yeah, well, at least we'll show them the card. Yeah, or we'll just. I, ask I don't them know nicely. about the kidnapping that's involved in this process. Well, yeah, I, I'm not familiar <laughs> with New Zealand laws, but I will get myself <laughs> educated. But yeah, we will ask them politely. But yeah. Uh, we are waiting for that fabled. So sleep dart into Bolton shot. Hey, this is an interesting line. I, I'm a little surprised to see Bolton shot here, just because it, it forces Brody to use his Snapdragon scalers if he wants to keep going with this turn. Unless he's just content to, you know, it's like I shut off your Starvo, so. Maybe I'm not necessarily worried about dominate effects unless it's something like an oak and old fused. Um, I gotta take a peek here. Can we take a peek? Maybe at uh, Calvin's been very good at hiding his cards, even from us. He has. He, he took the full five from the sleep dart, and it looks like he's just sort of. And you know, if if I'm in Brody's seat and and the opponent takes five from the sleep dart, I'm saying, okay, they really want to keep this hand. I I have the green light to push as much damage as possible in this turn. Yep, Fab and Sealand was there. Uh, I remember just the sheer celebration of it. It was such a, a community victory to discover it. What was it? Let's talk about it. Let's share that moment. And we're waiting for that moment here. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen nope. it. No clue. That's one thing that none of the players here at the celebrational have seen. They were not given an option to look at it, see it. And there is the Snapdragon Scalers here, Craig. Yeah, and like I said, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit surprised because Brody had the option of just using the bow a second time there. What was the combat chain? And what's interesting to me here is that you could con kind of consider it. Maybe Starvo takes a very conservative approach of blocking out, blocking out, blocking out until you find those big pieces. But when you let the sleep dart go, what's following that up? So the snappies into a another buffed up uh, Bolton shot for five go again on hit reload. So there could be an addendum to this attack. Yeah, and, and we know because of three of the kind, it would generally lock Brody out from playing any of the other cards, the, the non-arrows that would get loaded with the Voltaire. So the reload presents potentially a lot more danger. There's one piece of equipment that I really want to focus on that is going to be a game changer. It is going to be one of those very calculated plays by Kelvin Law, but the value is going to be so much more than what's printed on the card, and that's this right here. That's the Stalagmite, Bastion of Eisenloft. We talked about this yesterday, Craig, about how it's not about blocking for two. It's about blocking for two and just ending the turn. So those two blocks become six blocks. Those one blocks become five blocks, and suddenly Bastion of Eisenloft, Stalagmite, is an 11-point blocking card. That is the ceiling, more or less, for a card like that. <clears throat> 35 apiece here. And we're going to fire off another sleep dart. So we're going into REM sleep now. We're, we're inception. We're layering the dream state. Yep, and this one's buffed up. Uh, we, we, we do see Brody like taking this, this turn to really push damage. Uh, Kelvin had to end up blocking with that Starstruck, which I'm sure he didn't want to do, and oh. the Crippling Crush. These are the high-impact attacks that you were talking about that he's waiting for, that he's preserving his life total for. But they all showed up in the same hand, which is not the way you want it. I mean, the Living Legend Tournament in uh, Barcelona, when Starvo throws a Crippling Crush in front to block something, you're still nervous. But when he throws in front right now with the restrictions on that card, you are not seeing that Crippling Crush uh, down the line. The nerfs to uh, to Starvo are such that Crippling Crush is restricted to one copy. Oakenold, Starstruck, same thing. So it's not like this endless wave of beatdowns. It is one Crippling Crush. It's gone, and it was done. It was used up on a defensive, uh, in a defensive manner. Brody has to feel so good about that. Yes. Yeah. I the, the flip side, Brody did use a lot of resources that turn, right? It was the second three of a kind, two of his equipment pieces. Uh, he, he had used his his bag of leaves, as it were. Sack on, of on, leaves, on, baby. So, so, you know, the, the, 
there's not as much for Brody to work with moving forward, but he does not have to fear two of these high-impact attacks out of Kelvin's deck. I did the lean over to look into Brody's hand again. <laughs> yeah, d yeah. Did you get a good? <laughs> I did not. It did not help at all. Uh, <laughs> but the beautiful part about this again, this is Savage Feats. We get to have a little peek at the hand if we want to, as we're going to do right now. Have a look at Brody's hand if we can. What do we got? Well, that's another sleep dart. I think that's two. Uh, are those not polar polar blasts? These are ice quakes. Ice quakes. There we go. So we're going to be buffing up an arrow with the threat of a frostbite as well. Ice quakes. One of those uh, cuttable kind of rotating in and out cards. They they kind of have their day in the, in the sun, and then they're kind of not so uh, appealing. But here it is, buffing up this Endless Arrow with the added nastiness of a Frostbite token. Were you a fan of Ice Quake when you were playing, Lexi? I, I liked Ice Quake a lot. I thought it was a very good role player where, it, you know, if you arsenal it and then flip it up with the Lexi ability, you're giving them that, just that, that free incidental, you know, Frostbite token is a little bit extra disruption. And then when you play it and make multiple attacks, it, it the the three attack buff is only on the first attack, but the ice ability is on all, all your subsequent attacks. So you, you can really jam up opponents that aren't ready to block. Playing the blizzard here is going to be difficult if, if Brody didn't find a blue, but it looks like he's going to uh, he's going to just let it let it slide. He's gonna say that I'm content with just this. So Blizzard is asking Brody, Sorry. you're attack which had go again loses it if you want to pay two i'll give it back to you kind of like a pawn shop for uh, go against sure so the attack seems to go through and he's going to have a recursive effect here as that endless arrow bounces back to hand gives kelvin law a frostbite if kelvin's letting that one slide you think it's party time yeah yeah you, you got to think that he's going to have a, a decent turn here and also he has to be very happy that Brody didn't have a blue pitch in his hand there to pay through the, the blizzard and continue with an impactful turn. So there's another endless in hand. There's the red ice quake. And uh, the endless is already loaded up. But that seems like it's pretty much it for the turn. I think what Brody's looking to do here is what do I put in the arsenal, which it's going to be the ice quake. I'm just going to actually do this and then arsenal. I think oh, that's a. I, that, I like this line where he, he's using the other endless arrow to, to activate the bow. He's not going to resolve the bow ability. He doesn't have an arrow he wants to load. But he's saying, hey, I already have one endless arrow, and I need much more high impact arrow shots than this. So let's get this card out of my hand and draw up to full fresh four. And, and I think that's just a very sharp, astute play there. All right. So Kelvin has been very, very good at hiding the cards from us. Uh, but if you are on the receiving end, of a Guardian attack with one float and Tunic all loaded up, one card just hovering about, is there a Pummel to come? We yeah, don't know, but still. Kelvin loves Pummel. Like, we've seen it in a lot of his lists throughout the week, but this is not a Pummel matchup. So I, I'd be kind of surprised. Maybe he's got a couple of blues in, in his deck, but I, I would be pretty surprised if, if he shows up with Pummel. And some players, in this case, you know, you block the nine, and you're thinking, okay, I can Pummel on top of this, get the crush effect, everything. In certain cases, it's all about, um, you know, using some of those big power plays sparingly, parsing out the damage. I think that just getting three cards is good enough. That uh, that uh, crypt, uh, Spinal Crush is so devastating for a hero like Lexi that you don't need to Pummel over the top. If you get the three cards, that's oftentimes good enough. So here is that Winter's Bite again. Brody of utilizing the strategy that he wanted to come in with, which was make sure Kelvin is not playing with four cards, not playing with five cards. You wanted Kelvin to sort of have a situation where uh, you had to make tough decisions or give up something on your turn. Yeah, and I, I think if you're Brody, you're saying, hey, I blocked with three cards to cover this attack. Uh, what's the most impactful thing I can really do on my turn while preserving some of my resources for the future? And Winter's Bite is that thing. Crown of Seeds activation here with the crown uh, with the uh, tunic, so drawing up to another Spinal Crush. Yeah, and and I think Kelvin's considering just losing the Spinal Crush here. Um, you, know, you you have the option you could pay three for it, or you could just discard a card. And I think that it's all these iterations that Kelvin is going down. So two Earth cards. I see Ice, Spinal Crush. All right, so here's the Winter's Bite. 
asking for three. And look at that, Queenstown 2024 champion. It would be so cool to have that. I feel like in terms of all the cool uh, trophies that you can win in Flesh and Blood, this might be the most unique, the most rare. Yeah, the celebration was such, such a unique, special event. And it, it's not like you're going to go over your friend's house and they're also going to have one on their mantle. Oh, no, nope, that, that, that definitely not. So three paid through. Great ground is going to go ahead and pay the tax that Winter's Bright is asking for. Good. All right, he's going to flip the Ice Quake, which, again, flexibility is going to generate a Frostbite. Like you said, why do you like Ice Quake? Well, it has sort of double duty. It's going to flip, create the Frostbite, but he's just going to prevent, uh, present four from the Endless Arrow without a go-again effect. And, uh, yeah, tossing the Spinal Crush. So we've seen a Crippling Crush and a Spinal Crush oh. used for defense. Okay, yeah, the full four was covered because of the Crown of Seeds plus one card blocking. Uh, oh, right, yep. A little bit interesting, um, you know, Brody deciding to send that attack there. I, I would have, I was kind of on the fence, but it worked out so well for him where he, he denies the opponent the Spinal Crush attack on the next turn. You know, you, you want to talk about just how much on a, on a different plane these two players are. I've played a lot. I've had, you know, my successes. I've had my wins. Obviously, you have had so much success. I see a Spinal Crush into a Lexi. I'm like, yeah, I don't care what you throw it. Sure, yeah. You know? This, um, this is happening. Yeah, no, that, that I know what I'm doing. You know, this, this, is, this is my life now. But Kelvin has the patience, has the discipline. Yes. To not only wait, but also give up some of these opportunities for the late game, the long game, for, for sticking to a plan. That was something when I was playing Oldham, it's like, you don't want to trade damage. You stick to your plan. You stick to your game plan. It's attractive sometimes to take seven to send ten, but that's not what the game is about. And, and you got to think long term. And I think that's what Kelvin is thinking here. There's no time clock in this particular matchup. So he's thinking late game. He's been very defensive. He's given up a lot of these tools like Spinal Crush. He knows that, you know what, down the line, I think that a dominated Spinal Crush, as cool as that is, a dominated uh, Red Autumn's touch, you know, late game is just as nasty. Well, and, and the same thing from the other side, though, with Brody, where, you know, the temptation to go to your next turn with the six-card hand, right, where you're saying, I have a pump, I've got an arrow waiting for me, and I'm going to have four cards in my hand. No, because he made that play, he dodged the Spinal Crush, which, which is going to work out so well for him. It's just very interesting seeing both of these players, like you said, on, on just a slightly higher level where they just understand everything that they're getting and giving up on a turn-to-turn -turn basis. I like how you're very generous to sort of rope me into that when you say slightly higher level. That's sli maybe yeah. slightly higher than you. I, there's a, a whole just dimension between us when it comes to skill set, but it's just fun to watch nonetheless. I learned so much by sitting in this chair watching these high-level games, and it helps me improve. And I hope that you out there who is watching this also can sort of pick up some tips here because nobody has played more than these two. So Brody's still trying to rifle through those cards. That isn't sped up. That is, <laughs> that is at 1x. <laughs> And, it, yeah, it looks like another awkward hand for Brody. It, it, it's not enough arrow attacks going on, so. Well, it may be January, but it's summer here in Queenstown, but it's, it's winter in his hand right now. It's, it's pretty nasty and frosty, but you're not really going to get much going on there because you're not pushing any damage through. So I wonder if Brody's just going to cover this up. I mean, look at him. He's he's Yeah, really agonizing about this decision, and, and I don't blame him because... It, each turn, it's, it's felt like he's been very good about denying Kelvin that, that good fuse turn, and he, he's kind of felt like he's been in control, and then his deck's like, hey, you know what you could use on this turn? <laughs> Not arrows. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and, like, every Lexi player has gone through it. Yeah. You have, like, and the worst part is, like, you have momentum. You're ready for the kill shot. They gave you everything you have. You drop your four three Winter's Bites and a Partridge in a Pear Tree. Like, it's just nothing, right? It's just garbage. But Brody, for for as composed as he always is, this might be the most rattled I've seen him in a long time. Like, he, there was a, an exasperated sigh because he knows that this is a, a very difficult, precarious position for him to be in. But beyond that, remember you're talking about the importance and how good you feel about winning that first game? Yep. The, he, imagine if he had lost the first game and now he's drawing this piles of rags in these matchups.
Yeah, yeah, the pressure is definitely amplified as things go wrong for you. Here's a heater with a, an ice quake. So finally, doing something with it. It's going to be uh, pushed up over the top with the plus one off the Voltaire. Kelvin knows that there's no follow-up to this. No go again. The Snapdragon scalers are a thing of the past. Ice quake threatening in Frostbite on hit. So we're going to see what Kelvin can do. Kelvin, um, or rather Brody, for as paltry as his attacks have been, still managed to actually push through 15 damage. Yeah, yeah, he, he's ahead in the life totals in this game. But, but like we've said, he, he's used a lot of his one-use resources already, where the Snapdragon scalers are gone, the, the bullseye bracers are gone, even the quiver of rustling leaves is gone. So, you know, every time he uses his whole hand and, and ends up with only four cards and he's got to block Kelvin, his deck just doesn't play nearly as well off of one or two cards as Kelvin's deck does. Heatseeker does have the wonderful add and hit ability as well, not just the Frostbite, but basically beginning of the end phase, you look at the top card, put it face up in your arsenal. So that's kind of helpful, kind of almost like a, a ponder token that goes right into the arsenal. Yeah, and I think that's what's really making Kelvin think about this turn. Uh, you don't want to be giving the Lexi players these free cards. So Kelvin was kind of feathering that those civic steps. Mm -hmm. And again, the detriment of giving a Quicken token to a, you know, let's say you give it to a Guardian, you're not necessarily as scared as if you give it to something like Lexi. Yeah, like we said, you're preventing that damage, but you're giving it right back to them when they're able to use the plus one attack effect from Voltaire instead of having to give the arrow go again. So as it stands, there's still a Heat Seeker here with the Ice Quake that just pumps its tires a little bit at nine. Could be a potential three card block, a lot of three blocks in those uh, Starvo decks, but there's still a lot of two blocks in there as well. So there are a lot of two blocks, and, and just the fact that he's considering this civic steps getting in the mix tells you that he's, he, he must have some two blocks in his hand. Well, beyond that, I mean, uh, playing something like Bravo, playing even Oldham, there was a lot more opportunity to sort of cover those uh, or find other ways, other methods to to block out here, be it from, you know, Oldham's defense reaction ability yep. uh, or just having Crown of Providence or something like that that you can toss in front. Now, Crown of Seeds is a great card, don't get me wrong. Um, I was completely wrong about it i thought it was the weakest the weakest oh wow like, i was completely i think a lot of people had that initial impression like maybe they just didn't understand the sheer uh importance the impact that it had to cycle to do this and just sort of create this monstrosity of a hero that was you know starvo then oldham but ultimately even I'm, even briar at one point briar at one point yeah usa nationals won by charles dunn on Briar with Crown of Seeds. Yeah, pretty unbelievable. It was unbelievable. I was actually having a discussion about, um, you know, talking about other card games and such, and, and people asked me, like, do you, you know, worry sometimes about how certain uh, new card games come out, they're, the, the leaders of the classes are come out, and there's only one way to play a particular, you know, be it color, hero, whatever. And I said, you know what? And I used that example. I said, Briar has traditionally been a hero that... Uh, it just goes goes lightning fast. Just goes hard. Blows you down. I said, but USA Nationals was a complete 180. It was the complete opposite. So there's so much latitude in how you can build decks, and Crown of Seeds we see is such a powerful card. We and don't talk about Starvo. Th this was kind of wild because Kelvin decided he was just going to take that whole attack on the chin, nine points, a, a, a frostbite token, and give Brody the extra card. And so we'll, we'll see if this is the pivot turn that we, we look for in the Starvo games where Kelvin's able to kind of take over. We shall find out. He has to pay through a Frostbite in order to actually okay. pay for the attack. What that attack is, we shall find out. He's going to be pitching two Lightning cards, Heaven's Claws and Lightning Surge, to find the Oakenold, one of the gems ah. of Starvo. And you heard a little <laughs> bit of a scary... Uh, <laughs> And he's fusing it with Autumn's Touch and a uh, Winter's Bite. So this is where this gets absolutely filthy. So what is this? <laughs> and, Br and Brody knew this was coming, right? Not this exact attack, but he knew that there was going to be something he absolutely had to deal with on this turn after Kelvin took all that damage. I mean, even Brody being scared is, is kind of like 
still calm, calculated, and, sure. and resolved, right? So Oak and Old, again, from Everfest is such that you got to fuse it with Earth and Ice, which is the Autumn's Touch and the Winter's Bite. But what it does is when it's fused, you get plus two, dominate, and if it hits, put two random cards on the bottom of the deck. Cool. But hey, what about the other element? Plus two is cool. Plus four, that much better, because Starvo now bumping this up to 11 and just giving an extra pat on the back and say, go get them, champ. Yeah, 11 dominate, you, you know you're just going to have to deal with this. And Brody's question here, you, you, and you know the hammer's coming after this, right? A, a frosty hammer's going to follow this up. Kelvin also is going to have the arsenal card. So Brody's question is, do I take all of this damage, discard two cards, go to my turn with two cards in an arsenal, or do I try to mitigate with some of this damage? Maybe I block this with one card, discard two, I block the hammer with another card, and... You know, I say I prevented as much damage as possible, and hopefully your next turn isn't as impactful as this one is. Well, it's a different story if Brody is at, like, 11 or 15 health. He's at 35. He's yes. still very, yeah. very alive here in this matchup. This is the first real, outside of that spinal crush, this is the first real um, um, offense that is kind of guaranteed to disrupt. As you heard Brody say, let me try. So he said, ah, and let me <laughs> translate. And that says, okay, this is going to be uncomfortable. I'm going to have to think through this because I have to mitigate the damage and maybe put something in Arsenal. We have to see what that is. That's what he meant by that uh, exasperated, um, scary noise. But think about Starvo of old. You're chaining Oak and Old into another Oak and Old into a Crippling Crush into a Crippling Crush. That's no longer the case. We know that one Crippling Crush is already in the garbage. This is an Oak and Old that's being played offensively. There's still that Starstruck that still exists. And, and an interesting little facet to this situation, the Lexi deck, the, the cards that comprise the deck are so different where you've got such a mix of blues and reds, non-attack actions and attack actions. And Oak and Old says, you discard at random. Yeah. So, so, so Brody might, might be like, hey, like I, I can be risky here. I can just take this. I can discard two at random and potentially have still a very strong turn. But if I discard the wrong two cards, maybe I barely have a turn at all. Well, he's got a Heat Seeker, a Blood Rot. Uh, he's got uh, apparently uh, he, he, the, he's got the chills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's really not happy. Yeah, it looks like the, the two arrows, as you said, he, heat seeker and an infecting shot and and then you know two non-attack actions and you know depending on what he he is left with at the end here it's a very different situation for him i mean yeah plus the two ice quakes that are in there like he kind of like he shook his hand like it was an etch-a-sketch like he's like sure. can we just erase this can yeah, we change yeah. this up here could this be you know an unmovable red can we just figure this out to some degree and that wouldn't even do it <laughs> like you know so there's not much you can do as this dominated Okanold has really rocked brody's world as uh you know we're seeing what starvo's whole bread and butter is in kelvin law's patience game and then taking a big attack in order for exactly this now what follows that up? We don't know. But Brody is going to take the whole thing here. Yeah, and, and I feel like we're playing, you know, Brute again, where he's saying, let's just roll the dice. Let's roll the dice, see what happens. <laughs> oh, the dice aren't behaving. Nope. Try again. There we go. All right, so the bad, the last two, let's see what they are. Brody takes a peek. Oh, he so he kept the blood rot, or was it the heat seeker? I, I believe he kept a blue and an arrow, which is exactly where he wanted to be at the end of this situation. Well, good for him. I mean, that, that's a really, at least there's a little, for him. little silver <laughs> lining here. Well, good for him. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> he just had his whole world rocked there by that oak and old, and uh, yep, like every good story, you end it with a winter's whale. So, again, with the threaten, threatened, uh, Frostbite. But yeah, in terms of the best case scenarios, keeping a blue and a, uh, an arrow, which I believe is, is it a heat seeker, a blood rot? I believe it's an infecting shot. Which infecting is the, shot, sorry, the blood rot, yeah, yeah yep. which creates on hit, which creates the blood rot. So that's, he does manage to actually cr find an opportunity here to, you know, keep the arrow with the most damage output. And, so this is a very, very interesting situation. Uh, Kelvin's, uh, you know, saying, hey, I, I can see your codex. It's face up on that side of the board. If I block with the, my stalagmite, I'm giving you another frost token and I'm locking you out of this turn. It's also interesting because these attacks that we said Kelvin only gets one look at, if Brody plays the codex, he can actually get one of those attacks back. That is a very good point. 
that is a very good point. There are other uh, there are other cards in the Starvo deck that could potentially bring those cards back. Um, I don't know if Kelvin's playing something like So Tomorrow. There's cards like the you know Pulse the Candle Hold and things like that will yep. bring those cards back. But if Brody's going to do the heavy lifting for him, uh, he might see three Okanolds, and that is very helpful. So Kelvin Law here, uh, I'm uh, you know, there's the Stalagmite which could stop the uh, the play, but also. I'm curious, is there an opportunity here? This is me just being a little ignorant of some of the rules and the nuances that when you put the stalagmite forward, can you respond with the tunic before the frostbite yes, generates? Yes, absolutely can. Okay. And, and, you know, Brody being a veteran player like he is, he will see that line. That is a great point that you're making. I was just, yeah. So I'm not entirely sure if there's an opportunity to respond, which there is, and I appreciate that again. Uh, so that is certainly something there. So Kelvin might actually just sort of balk on putting the stalagmite forward, knowing that there's an easy way out of that situation. But if that tunic was not online, again, stalagmite would have gone above and beyond of not just representing one block here, but freezing out the uh, codex play. Plus, let's be real here. Like you said, Kelvin wants an open arsenal in order to be able to get benefit from the codex to go recover that oak and old. Yeah, but and that's one of the things about being Starvo and playing Crown of Seeds, right? Is you, you have the option of either leaving that card there and you, you don't have to discard from the codex ability or activating Crown, putting the card on the bottom because you want to be able to buy back one of your attacks. So once again, this is the the best case scenario that Brody was left with, which is actually pretty good, all things considered. It's a yep. infecting shot for five go again. On hit, create a blood rot token. Blood rot tokens introduced in Outsiders, another really cool draft set from a little while ago, uh, which means that you generate a token that says at the end of your turn, pay three or take two damage. So this has the potential to be a seven point attack. Yes, and and... You know, if you're Brody, you're saying, hey, I, I got beat up real bad by, by an Oakland old turn, making me discard two cards, and then a hammer giving me a frostbite, and I'm still representing seven points plus the codex. All right, he just powered up with the mystery sandwich. We don't know what's in it. Is that within the rules? Rare candy. He just, he just evolved, baby. This is where it gets dangerous. If you're Kelvin Law and you see Brody Spurlock. Yeah, where, where are the judges? <laughs> Can we get a ruling on that? <laughs> Outside interference. So he's powering up, baby. He's hulking up. That's I, honestly, if you're Kelvin, I would be a little bit worried that that now uh, Brody's got resolve, a full stomach, and uh, and he's got ham in his veins. Well, I, and I think that snack is also just an indication that Brody is back to being like fairly comfortable. Yeah, no, that's that's when, very, when he was stressed right. out. It was all about the cards. He's flicking them. He's, he's totally focused on the board. And now he's saying, the pressure's on you. I can relax just a little bit. And while I'm relaxing, I'm going to make sure I'm hydrated. I'm going to make sure I'm not hungry. And it's going to allow me to keep focusing throughout the match. You're not wrong. I mean, when I'm stressed in a tournament, which is essentially all the time, <laughs> I never eat. I do not eat. It's, it's something that I can't do. So I'll, you know, you arrive at the venue at like 8, 8.30, uh, doors open, first round, and then I am so locked up, so tense, it doesn't happen. So pushing forth with the stalagmite, floating the resource, there it is. Uh, and here comes that codex. And now it's, it, we're going to see if Kelvin wants to respond here with the crown of seeds in order to go ahead and find uh, another uh, cart. Yeah, and it looks like Kelvin's very content to, to leave his arsenal. He doesn't want to end up discarding. So, like, if he pitches a card, activates the crown, and then he discards another card, he doesn't even have a hand to work with. He's going to be using the, uh, sorry, the drill shot red. Go pick it up. It's a free arrow. Has some significant implications over here because if it does get leaked through, you can drop a minus one counter on something, probably the civic steps. But then again, there is a situation where you're disincentivized to put the minus one on the civic steps. Because you want Kelvin to block twice with it. You might want to go ahead and squeeze two Quicken tokens. Now, I know that sounds a little odd, sounds a little weird, but there, that is something to, to consider as well. Yeah, we're, we're moving into the, the mid to late game at this point in the game. We see the life total starting to get a little lower. The boards start to get a little cleaner as the equipment gets used up. And I, I think having the, the two armor in reserve is, is just so valuable moving forward that... I really like this play out of Brody where he's saying, you want to take the damage? 
you no longer have that that insurance plan, that the full two armor insurance moving forward in the game. Well, let's talk about those five attack arrows that you might see, like the five Gogans, yep. like Infecting Shot, like Heat Seeker. If you can just pop, put a three and the two block in front of it, that's very important. But looks like Kelvin is already thinking about using the Civic Steps. And again, when you block with Civic Steps, you give your opponent a Quicken token. So he's doing so. No reactions. Okay, and not even covering up the entire hit and caboodle here. So two leak plus a minus one off the drill shot. Where's it going? I think Brody's still deciding. And he might be considering exactly that. He might be thinking, I mean, if I put it on the tunic, then you're disincentivized of blocking with the tunic, which means you'll always have that resource rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you need to put it on the footsteps here. It's, it's depending on how long the game drags out for you know, if you force Kelvin into a situation where he needs to block again, you want him to be blocking with the tunic. You don't want to keep giving him that that crown of seeds tunic free turn. But, you know, Brody just, just going through all of the decisions here and being very careful with what he puts the counter on. I mean, Brody can utilize a little psychic damage and just put on the crown of seeds and say, I'm going to get you anyways. <laughs> the alpha move. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Drill shot. Uh has punched through. So is, Bro is Brody, I believe Brody's still deciding on to where yes. the minus one token is going. And again, it's not straightforward. There, There's two very significant options. And, you know, if you're thinking civic steps, if I put on civic steps, then like you said, in certain cases, I'm going to yoink that tunic out of you. You're going to have to block with it. And then you don't have the rolling resource that works so beautifully with Crown of Seeds. Otherwise, if I put it on the tunic and force you to block with Civic Steps, I get a Quicken token. But at the same time, there are, might be situations where that Quicken token is essentially burned. Do you, I haven't seen something like Falcon Wing. Falcon Wing was a card that was very prevalent in Lexi decks. Is that just sort of not as, as important anymore? You know, I, we're in a whole new world in, in Living Legend, right? Where the, the deck construction is just slightly different. I haven't seen Brody's full list. Um, you know, this morning, we looked at it earlier. I don't remember if he had this card in it or not, but it's possible, you know, maybe he has some number, but he, he doesn't have them sighted in for this matchup. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. Maybe just with the addition of a Bullseye Bracers, you're saying, I, I don't need a natural go again arrow. I've got that little extra juice that I need on those big turns to keep attacking with arrows. Well, this is Living Legend format. We are in a whole new world, but... Craig, don't you dare close your eyes because we're about to get funky here as it is a Starvo activation. Is that we a... don't talk about Starvo. I got I to gotta remember that that happens. Yeah, you forget that it's coming every time. I do. Yellow Autumn's Touch, uh, 8 Dominate Go again. So we're finally seeing some of the damage output and uh, no disruption on this. It's a little damage the old-fashioned way, the way Grandma used to do it. Eight, dominate, go again. Brody's got life to spare here. He's got some uh, some pocket changes if he wants to just sort of absorb this, but he better have a heater of a hand. And here is some of that detriment. Now, Brody talking about his strategy of wanting to run nine Winter's Bites, yeah. but here they are just polluting the hand. Yeah, there, there's a lot of non-attack actions in his list. Um, a lot of ice ones, which, you know, we see have high upside sometimes, but like you said, you're running that risk. The whole power of Voltaire is deploying arrow after arrow after arrow. And when you draw these hands with only one arrow in them, the deck just doesn't have the same power level. So they're uh, right now at the uh, out there at the world premiere. We've got the uh, the host of the uh, of the master of ceremonies asking, did anyone open the fable? And not one person yet. So once again, we will let you know when that happens because the heavy hitters fabled is still a mystery. And, you know, we say Brody has a lot of life total to work with, but Starvo is one of those decks that we see able to close out the game once the opponent's at 10 or less, where, hey, you know, I, I get lucky two turns in a row. These are just dominated attacks. You, you cannot defend these out if you want to. So that's got to be part of what Brody is considering in these situations. He's uh, going to throw a lightning surge. For four, no go again. It only has go again if it's out of arsenal. Lightning in the Starvo deck feels kind of like the 
the least valuable. So I feel it's also the most flexible to a degree of okay. which lightning cards you want to put in there. I've seen, you know, you see blinks, flash, um, cards like those. But red lightning surge is very cool to see. Yeah, it's one that we see pop up from time to time. I think it's getting more inclusion as we move forward. We haven't seen pulses. No, no. I, there's a lot of powerful cards still in Kelvin's deck that we have not seen yet. It's funny because br from Brody's side, you're saying, you know, I haven't seen an Awakening yet. And by taking a bunch of damage, I actually insulate myself from the effect of Awakening. Very good point. Very good point. Typically, the I take damage to make a cool Awakening is like a turn zero kind of uh, on the receiving end. I've, I've done that. It felt really good. You just eat it and send it back when it matters. And uh, but no, that's not uh, that's not a point. But you got to think that Brody would have just Brody is like, yeah, I'd rather be at 13 than eight. But yeah, uh, Awakening's not as nasty anymore. So flipping a cold snap, creating a frostbite token, pitching for a chilling ice vein. I spoke to Brody yesterday, and he said that uh, only one fusible card in his deck, and I believe it's chilling ice vein. Mm -hmm. But it's a good one. Not bad. And keep in mind, he just flashed a red Arctic Incarceration, the first card he played in this uh, matchup. That could be a cool chain ender as well to sort of just pare down the reach that Kelvin might have. Just giving him three Frostbites, one already on the board, it would be four. That makes for a very difficult uh, taxation to sort of push through if you want to make a big turn, a big splash play for Starvo. In this case, red uh, Chilling Ice Vein for six go again, getting use of that Quicken token. Yeah, and it's kind of an interesting little mind game that's happening right here where you, you fuse the Chilling Ice Vein, it, it's coming in for six, so you're saying, I'm demanding two cards, and then maybe I can follow it up with another arrow, or maybe I'm just going to do this Arctic Incarceration and, and freeze you out of your next turn completely. I, I mean, we see Kelvin already has one Frostbite. Another three on top of that means that, you know, most of his turns, the, the typical turn of... of Swing with hammer and then arsenaling a card might not happen. So there's the first pulse, pulse of Eisenloft in Kelvin Law's hand. I believe I saw a flash in there, Heaven's Claws, and two Earth cards. So you have everything you need. So the question here for Kelvin is, do I have A, the, the life total to perhaps withstand this turn? B, do I have the resources needed to pay through all of the taxes that Chilling Ice Vein is yep. going to present? And after that, there's an Arctic Incarceration that is going to slam the door shut. So Kelvin has five, uh, has five cards in hand, has all the, all the elements lined up, Captain Planet's on hold. But the problem here is there's this nasty turn that Brody's cobbling together to win that trophy the queenstown 2024 champion the celebrational trophy that we're going to be giving away in very short order yeah, and yeah like i said this is so interesting because kelvin doesn't know if there's another attack or not which makes all of the difference here brody's been skunked by some pretty bad hands multiple times this turn Kelvin's got to think, well, like maybe it happens again. Or maybe he's due. Like, you can't really lean on such a small sample size of these things. But Kelvin has to always prepare for the worst. He's thinking hard here. All right, so um, it's been quite a matchup here. The stakes are high. Brody, no stranger to the pee-pee paws. So that's what we're happening over here. <laughs> way, way to put it so elegantly. And that is not even a Flake original. That is uh, that is someone else, someone in the community. Back in the um, first Outsiders event ever in Chicago, in the finals, I think it was, Brody was on Azalea. He had to go use the, the bathroom. So, so we're lauding him for, for staying nourished, staying hydrated, and now we're feeling the effects of that later in the match. Hey, <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, but yeah. we're going to give you a little treat here because apparently we've got some alpha packs that they're like, oh. When you say we, it's, like, I, it's the royal we. It's like right now, I have some alpha packs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ultimately, they're not mine. They're not yours. They're our good friend, Ethan's, and I want everybody to know. Ethan, can you jump on real quick here to, to just grant us permission to open these? 
You have my you have my blessing, Flake. I've never pulled anything good in my life. So that's <laughs> why that's why you're in charge of it now. You got it. Well, if you think I have any luck, you are also sorely mistaken. So we'll each uh, we'll each grab one. Uh, I guess it's oh, one of each right here. Here's what we'll do. Yeah. I I think the alpha pack is the most exciting. Well, okay. We'll we'll say we'll save that one for last. I, should we go work backwards? Yeah. I I I think. I would like you to open these two first edition packs. Okay. And then I'll finish with the alpha pack. That's fair. And we'll see where we're at. That's fair. We're going to start with Crucible of War, first edition. Friends, we need a little bit of love here. We want you in chat. We saw so many ones rolled on camera. All of that juice, all of that good juju is still out there in the atmosphere. Totally. And not only that, not only that, there was no Fable to open amidst hundreds and hundreds of packs. So, so we're due. We are due. Yes. That is the best mentality to have in your head when you go to the casino. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Don't listen to me. Oh, I dropped it. <laughs> Here we go. What are they worth after they're damaged? Uh, well, these are... These have these have been on on camera. These are famous packs now. So here we go. This is Crucible of War first edition. We've got an Arcane Rising first ed two and an Alpha pack. Uh, let's just tear this bad boy open. So here we go. Um, the wonderful people at White Rabbit in Germany brought us some German history packs. Speak of the devil, Yellow Sleep Dart. <laughs> <laughs> disappointed face on the, Ethan's like, all right, we got a yellow sleep dart. Uh, we've got a red snapback, a yellow blessing of serenity. Guardians love their yellows. <laughs> yeah, yellow blessing of serenity. I have hit and run yellow. Look at you with the yellows. Dang right. <laughs> I have a foreboding bolt blue. I have a first edition out for blood. Out for blood. There it is. And now we get to the juicy stuff, I think. Not yet. Uh, a blue consuming volition. The playability of these cards is through yep. the roof. Yeah, all, all of these are going right in the deck. Definitely. And now the, now the juicy stuff. We saw the blue consuming volition. What's better? Let's wrap it up to yellow. Everyone's favorite. <laughs> nice rainbow foil. There. Thank you. Now we get to the good stuff. Ooh. Oh, this is actually kind of cool. That's kind of cool. This is kind of cool. It is a first edition Talishar. First ed Talishar. And now the juiciness. Okay, all right. Red reinforce the line. Sure, I mean... Definitely playable. Yeah, uh, yeah, there are some players out there who hate fun who would play this. We are going to open the rest of the packs later. Because oh, okay, okay, we're, we're, we're back in it. Brody's back. He's like, that pack was so bad, let's just get back to the game. Sure. And we're back. There we go. So, game two of the best of three. Brody has uh, essentially... He's rejuvenated. Okay. He's uh he's ready to rock and roll here. So if uh, last you left, it's chilling ice vein is six. Go again. There was a reveal of cold snap creating the frostbite that we can see. Uh, let me see here. There we go. All right. So so the frostbite here was created by the the opening of the cold snap. Right. Then we got the plus one from Voltaire because there was a quicken token from the now gone boots. This is a great synopsis here. Hold on. Well, I'm not done yeah, here. Yeah, I know. All right. Long ago, it, it, I should have just start this like, you know, at the beginning of time. No. So here is the Chilling Ice Vein, which got the plus one option from the Voltaire. The go again comes from the utilization of the civic steps, the Quicken token giving this go again, as we see right here. So it's a six attack. Go again. Frostbite is not fun. But hold on a second, because this bad boy right here got full John Madden by this guy over here, the <laughs> Arctic Incarceration, all right? And now we're going to button hook it back over here to Kelvin, who is thinking, man, oh, man, this is not fun, because if we go to Kelvin's hand, we know that Kelvin has all the nice re uh, ingredients recipe to make a pretty nasty sandwich yeah, they, that Brody would not even Brody wants to eat. Well, yeah, Kelvin's all rolled up here, but the problem is the chilling ice vein 
it is right. going to take at least one card if you don't block it because of its on hit ability. And if you put multiple cards in front of it, now you've got even less of a hand, and and maybe he can't fuse after that. <laughs> Yeah, on the eighth day, God created Dominate. You're, you're correct, and we're all better for it. And we're going to use the Pulse of Eisenloff, one of the most valuable cards when it comes to uh, Starvo. It is a dual, uh, dual element, Ice and Earth. But beyond that, what it does is it, it is a six-block defense reaction, which perfectly eats up this Chilling Ice Vein. Well, and it, it, it cleans up one of those Frostbite tokens, too, in a very clean manner. And keep in mind, Ice... Earth and elemental action cards have plus one defense now when blocking this turn. So it, it does work. And there's the Arctic Incarceration uh, that was played. This uh, this should be four Frostbites. Three. He, he, oh. So when he played oh, he the paid pulse, through the event. Yep, you're he right. had to pay for it. There was the opportunity for this to go up to four, but yep. you're right. Paying through the two cost, paying three for it, uh, creating three. Sorry, I, I'm, still, I'm still thinking about the creation of the universe and yes. how we got oh, to yeah. this particular point in time right now. There's a lot to take into account here, Craig. All right, so he did give up one of the uh, one of the pulses, but there's Pulse of Candle Hold in his hand right now, which is Lightning Earth. He needs to find ice in order to complete it. Yeah, I, and I think the, the, the Pulse of Eisenloft was the ice, ice card that he needed to hang on to that turn. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Kelvin might have to just sort of pump the brakes. He has to find it again, but again, it's it's a situation. Kelvin has very much demonstrated that he's willing to be patient. Yes. He's willing to pick and choose his time. So if he has to give up a card like that, he knows he's like, I'll find it later. I'll get it back. We'll get there. I've got Crown of Seeds. I've got a lot of cards that block for three high value stuff. I'm I will eventually get there. Plus, keep in mind, he knew that that Arctic incarceration was going to basically slam the door on any kind of crazy shenanigans he wants to pull. Oh, it was that close. I was wondering if Kelvin was going to miss his tunic trigger. Which, I mean, when the games are this tight, that can mean all, all of the difference in the world. And, I mean, chat catches it all the time. I mean, this is Kelvin Law. Kelvin Law has the most XP by a country mile. And even he forgets Tunic sometimes. It, would, it almost slipped his mind. Well, and, and, and that's the, the pressure of the match, right? When you're trying to think about this turn, last turn, next turn, what cards are in the discard pile for my opponent, what do I need to play around, it's so easy to just miss something that's just, just so mandatory like the Tunic trigger. And I don't understand why everybody was complaining about Winter's Whale. The, you know, Kelvin pitched three cards to swing for four. <laughs> a, a warm four at that. Yeah, not even threatening a, 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 an on hit here. So Brody at eight, as... As innocuous as this looks, as, as paltry as a four vanilla damage looks, Brody might have a big turn, but at the same time, if he goes down to four, a dominated Autumn's Touch doesn't matter what the on hit is. That gets the job done. Yeah, yeah, we're at the point where Brody has to start being very careful with his life total. Uh, Kelvin's played so well this game, just, just navigating turn to turn perfectly where the, you know, the, the temptation of hanging on to those fused turns. Well, the trouble here, frankly, Craig, is the fact that there it is. Two Rain Razors in the hand right there for Brody Spurlock. Those block for zero. They do, at instant speed, increase the damage output of your arrows by two, but they block for nothing. Those are pieces that you want for a massive turn. But what is uh, tucked away in the arsenal? We're not sure. There's a cold snap. I mean, you have damage output. You have some little surprise factor, too but you have to resolve this hammer, which he does. Brody just opens the door for it and lets it in. Well, yeah, I, I, if he tries to cover some of that damage with one of his arrows, then the Rain Raiders just become so much less effective anyway. Tunic to two? Tunic to two. Brody ain't going to make that mistake. He's no never way. missed the tunic in his life. I don't, think, I don't think so. <laughs> no. So Cold Snap's going to open up here again. I believe a Cold is Cold Snap. Yeah, Cold Snap asks for uh, pay one or freeze the arsenal. Yep. No arsenal there. No worries. Kelvin's going to be like, I laugh at you and your taxation. It's a little bit interesting that Brody, you know, he used one of his arrows to pay for that when potentially he could have, you know, it started with uh, pitching a Rain Razors because he, he doesn't know what he's drawing off of the top, and the arrows seem very valuable in this situation. Yeah, I'm wondering if he's looking for something where he can go, you know, four go again or five go again and then go bang, bang, double arrow, bring Kelvin to a very precarious position 
where he has to block the next arrow, has to block the next attack. We'll see what happens here as Brody now, with two floating, is really considering. I think his hand is like Codex, two Rain Razors, and uh, a Winter's Bite. I believe a Winter's Bite, and it's kind of interesting because he could... He could play for a situation where, you know, he Winter's Bites, takes a card out of his opponent's hand, he makes an attack that Kelvin blocks, and then he Codexes, and the, whatever the last card in Kelvin's hand is, he has to discard when he puts a card back into his, his arsenal. So I believe that's a break ground in hand. I think I saw a Winter's Grasp in a Kelvin's hand. Um, Polar Blast. And uh, one more, Mystery Meat, we'll call it. Sure. Uh, Blizzard just seems to be the right move. So both players are yeah, yeah, in a situation where Kelvin is feeling comfortable from the capacity that, you know, I haven't seen an arrow yet. I've got a little bit of life to play with. No problem. But the uncomfortability is, comes from the fact that he's 0-1 in this series. And that has to feel nasty. Absolutely. This has been a grueling, grueling series here already. And we're just, you know, we're just halfway through it. Yeah, I mean, game one was spectacular. It was really fun to watch that one. And then we see that this game, somehow it's even more of a grind than the, the first <laughs> game one. So it, we're getting the maximum amount of pleasure out of watching these guys battle it out. So... Uh, Hearing it from from the eye in the sky. Game one, I think, uh, was about seven or eight turns, we're, and we're past that. So sure. both of them were CC. This one, it's just it's incredible because you got to think where when you're playing with new cards, you don't have the muscle memory of looking at your hand, knowing how to block, what to do, what the capabilities, the reach, this and that. When you're playing a deck that you've played so much of in a format with other, against other heroes, you're kind of a little bit... You, there it is. Whoa. We are in New Zealand. That could have been Legolas. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you never know. The elves of Lorien are here, but they're helping out Lexi at this point as double rain razors is going to be a nasty, nasty oh. prelude to some arrow that is going to ruin Kelvin's day. And this is funny. You know, Brody has to make his decision first. So Kelvin's going to get to see what he takes before... You know, Kelvin has to decide what he wants. And even getting a three for seven at this point is going to just be a very effective demand two cards out of the opponent situation because Brody's down to four life. The Lexi ability flashed that Arctic incarceration, giving a frostbite to Kelvin Law. And he saw this before. I mean, the, the information of seeing an Arctic incarceration, that's the last one, I believe, the last red Arctic incarceration. So again, it's just a way to say, you know, poke and prod, do some damage, and then at the end of the chain, just slam the door shut. You, if you want to take this damage, I'm going to make it exceptionally expensive for you. Plus four to all arrows. Can Brody extend it beyond just one follow-up arrow? Is there anything that he can do beyond that? Or is it just the plus four on one nasty arrow? Yeah, I believe it is just the plus four on one nasty arrow, but th there's, there's so many little elements here where... Kelvin still has some floating resources. So even though he's going to put a card into his arsenal here and have to discard, he can use the Crown of Seas with these floating resources to draw back up to a, to a hand and potentially have a fused hand again. Uh, I say I like living with a legend format until it comes to these kinds of gritty ass, like gritty, no, gritty. This part. is why we love it, because you get to make so many high impact decisions throughout the game. I agree. But the gritty aspect of this is such that I don't want to make these decisions. I don't want to be put into this stressful situation. It's too much. I just want to fuse and blow out my opponent. You know, I want to just throw a bajillion attacks with go agains. He found. OK, so he found a Bolton shot. It's a four attack arrow. It's going to be eight. And it will get go again because its attack value is above the base value. I, I, I think I like this line out of Brody where he's saying, I, I, you know, I'm at such low health. The opponent could just take this. And if he does, I might be in a lot of trouble. So let me make sure that I, I both attack for a lot and play the Arctic incarceration here just to disrupt Kelvin that extra bit. Makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. You want to get utilization of that Arctic incarceration too. <coughs> just throw as much debris in front of Kelvin Law's uh, trajectory to victory here. 
be, be, because you get the little extra help from the frailty token as well, where normally what would be a three cost seven out of arsenal is going to be a three cost six. The weapon as well. The, the the weapon instead of being you know potentially a chili four will be a chili three. You can cover it with only one card if you need to. I think I'm gonna make chili when I go home. Yeah, that's definitely what I was thinking about. Was what you were gonna make? It's like a once a month thing for me, okay. and it's we're like we're getting we're getting through the nitty gritty part of January. I haven't really. You make the extra big pot and then just parcel it out over a couple of weeks. I say a couple of weeks. Like, it's done in two days. Let's get real. <laughs> All right. So uh, the frostbite still haunting Kelvin's future plans here, and the Arctic incarceration is just even furthermore going to throw a wrench in those systems. This is a really nice play here by Brody Spurlock, who opted to go ahead and fetch that red Bolton shot off the back of two rain razors. I love that I have that power. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't, but like, Literally, this is just this is just Ethan who's just like I will entertain that for like a little bit. <laughs> this is the best crew to work with, right? I, it, I will it entertain is. it for five days. Five days, yes. Ethan has to deal with me. That's right. <laughs> Imagine that, Ethan. We fly like halfway across the world. You know, twenty-eight hours of travel, lugging all this equipment, all the hard work, all the setup, and then you're like, you're going to be working with Flake for five days. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Oh, great. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. All right. So um, a frailty token, a ponder token, and an eight-point Bolton shot. Now, typically Bolton shot, uh, when it's above uh, its value, if it hits, it does have the reload effect. But you need a completely clean arsenal space for that, which the Arctic Incarceration is picking up one of those spots. So there's no reload threat here. But there is the follow-up here of that Arctic Incarceration. And Craig, you got to think that that is going to feel so good to, for Brody to just say, it's damage, and we're just shutting you out. Five. So blocking five here. Of the eight, a little bit of work done. Well, and this is just another very patient line from Kelvin, which I, I kind of appreciate where he's saying, my turn is not going to be very good. I, you know, I, I have this frailty token. I already have a frostbite. Potentially, you can give me three more. I'm not going to have a turn. Let me prevent as much damage as possible. Uh, he put the, the lightning Gogan attack in his arsenal. Which, which I love, that, like, you know, it, it's going to be a four attack go again later in the game. Sure. That, so that card is so good. Yeah. So, so he, he's uh, taking the very patient approach. Hey, you get one more kind of freebie turn potentially to, to disrupt me. And then, you know, even on a bad turn, I have four coming out of the arsenal, four coming from my hammer. That's a lot of cards I'm denying you. And this is what we're talking about, of how lightning typically is the most flexible of the elements in the decks, and having a red lightning surge in this capacity, if you just have a blue in hand, uh, sorry, a blue ice, you can go four go again into ice hammer, and suddenly it's eight damage over two two specific, two specific attacks with an on-hit frostbite. It's incredible the what you can conjure up with such limited resources. All right, so Kelvin Law does take three, goes down to... Uh, Goes down to 11, and oh, I like. Wow. I do like the patience of Brody here, not using the Arctic Incarceration, knowing that so many cards were already committed, but here's another three of a kind. This is the last one. But without any of the other equipment, I think the most likely scenario is, you know, two go-again attacks, followed by the Arctic Incarceration. And we might see Kelvin just do the exact same thing this turn they, that he did last turn, where it's, you know, put two cards in front of the first attack, put two cards in front of the second attack, and, and you know, we'll wait. We'll, we'll, we'll try this again. Let's have a look at what he picked up here. That's the Chilling Ice Vein. That's the first bit, and it is fused with a Red Winter's Bite. Brody Spurlock, I believe, also picked up a Heat Seeker and maybe a, a, uh, and maybe a Searing Shot. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, he was, again, rifling through it at light speed here, but ultimately a Chilling Ice Vein that is fused is pretty gross. It's going to be... Gobbled up here. Again, full coverage for the Ice Vein. But the beauty of this Ice Vein, Craig, is that every attack this turn inherits that ability. Yeah, yeah. Now Kelvin was is definitely going to be obligated to block the next arrow attack. Uh, infecting Shot, Bolton Shot, and Heat Seeker. As well as a Winter's Bite. Uh, sorry, Searing Shot. That's my bad. Five go again off this uh, ice vein is covered up, but again, there's going to be 
some awkward blocking uh, to be done here. And we might see that we might see that Arctic Incarceration survive another turn. I think that's kind of just like a, a of this like get out of jail free card that he has. Well, it, it's funny because Brody, the way Brody's hands have been playing out, he, he's forcing Kelvin to block with his whole hand. So he, he doesn't need to play the Arctic Incarceration when the opponent doesn't have a hand. So it's covered. Here is the infecting shot representing six on paper with the plus one from Voltaire, with the on hit here and that blood rot. It's got to feel good. Again, those blood rots, they do stack up. They do become awkward. And it's, it's six on hit, you know, a potential eight. It's pretty nasty. And it's getting to the point where once you have this, this face up Arctic incarceration, it, it's, you know, a card without go again. You need to be very careful what the other card is that you arsenal. And, and I believe that we saw uh, another Winter's Bite out of Brody's hand, which is almost the perfect card to put into the arsenal after that. But you don't end up with the, the extra arrow in your arsenal where you're able to deploy two Gogan attacks with Voltaire and then the final arrow out of your arsenal. All right, this is locked up here. The Insidious Chill blocking two means that the Tunic comes in to sort of close the deal. And you're right. Because if you can't put something in Arsenal that has go again, that's what we're talking about, Falcon Wing. Falcon Wing was a great card to Arsenal face down when you had two cards in there because you can open your turn with the natural go again. You don't have to rely on Voltaire to give you that space. In this case, uh, there it is. There's that Lightning Surge Red. It's going to get some job done. And what, uh, what a perfect little match to uh, Brody's life total at four. So <laughs> four, there's a go again on this, but it doesn't matter because there's no more cards in Kelvin's hand. But it would have been so brutal if he did manage to escape this turn let's say with the uh insidious chill that you could pitch it hammer like, so good kelvin staring down brody spurlock here brody's done a very good job i mean ever since the the lowest of lows which was that oak and old to where we are now he's navigated some of these turns he's been he himself has been patient so we've been really giving credit to kelvin law's game plan and patience and discipline but brody has been sitting on that arctic incarceration that many other players would just say yeah you know go again go again snap that off but he has waited for it because at some point that is going to buy him a, a breath of air in a situation where he's going to need it and also, his hands haven't lined up perfectly throughout this game. He's, he's had some clunkers, but all of the extra cards that he's put in his deck have been these disruptive elements able to keep the, the opposing, you know, Starvo deck off of those three, four-card hands. And so that means, hey, I, I have a bit of a clunker, but when I do, you also don't have that great turn that you're looking for. Brody Spurlock here playing to win this game and become the celebrational champion and have his own card design, God help us all, be printed into <laughs> flesh and blood. Kelvin Law looking to just dust off the Yoji deck and go for one extra game. And make a much more reasonable card. That's correct. <laughs> Print a card where the game text fits on the actual paper. Thoughtful, very cool yeah, I like was his it card. Thoughtful Gust Wave? Was yes. that what it's called? Yeah, Thoughtful Gust Wave. You got to think that Brody's card, Silent Auction, I mean, there was definitely thought put into it. Um, and I, like I said, it's, it's going to take, it's going to take some work. It's going to take, uh, uh, like, a, like like the UN needs to get involved. Uh, it needs a personal trainer. It needs a whole re like a whole revamp. I love the spirit of it, the the sort of the bargaining, the gaming of it, the game within a game. We we just need to to get like a an English professor to sort of sort it out. It's it's funny because my you know the the runaways were talking about this in our Discord, and they said that you know Brody has created a card that is so complex he will definitely end up with an advantage every time it gets played because he just makes better decisions than everyone. But the, the downside of it is it just guarantees he runs out of time every single game that yeah. he plays it. All right, it's turn zero. Uh, Brody played Silent Auction. We've got four minutes left in the round. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's an option. That is an option. I mean, I, I used to feel like I was had an advantage because I, uh, I used to like buying French history packs and playing French cards because I speak French and just bring them into tournaments. Okay. And they're like, if, and like if it was a card that they, like everybody knows Pummel, everyone knows this, but if it's like you attack with like a blue debilitate and something like that, and they're like, what is that? I'm like, yeah, you can read it. <laughs> All right, so here's a Winter's Bite Red. 
looking to buy some time, looking to buy some resources in Brody's hand, or sorry, in Kelvin's hand right now, Earth, I see Ice, he's going to pitch through it, the last of the Red Winter's Bites as well, into the Arctic Incarceration, so there we go. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, if the hand doesn't work, that's what that Arctic Incarceration was for, Craig, I think it's just, okay, I don't have the pieces now, so let's let's just find ourselves another opportunity to to play so four on top of whatever this now becomes it's not like pitch six for a seven this is now pitch seven for uh for to throw a seven attack like a three a three cost card is now costing seven you no longer have a, a you can no longer combine those two three cards in hand to do anything more than hammer well yeah yeah even the, the hammer costs seven at this point and it's this this turned out so well for brody where you know, you, you you open with the Winter's Bite, and I think Kelvin had the opportunity to just discard, like, like a one-cost card instead of paying through it with a blue. And then he would have had the resources in his hand to actually still have a turn. But he was expecting Brody to make some attacks. So when Brody just plays the Arctic Incarceration, double arsenals, and, and passes, it's like, wow, did, did, did Brody just, like, completely time walk Kelvin in this situation? He did. Because there's a big stack of sadness right here, Craig. Well. I wanted to use the Telestrator again. It's all good. But yeah, four <laughs> Frostbites means that uh, everything becomes a lot nastier to deal with. This hammer is so heavy right now because it is just frozen solid from four Frostbites. Kelvin might have to pitch, th what, three cards yeah, to and, swing hammer? And I don't even know if he has the resources in his, in his hand to do it. I know there's an Earth card in there. He does have an Insidious Chill, so that's a blue. So he's got he's got one big piece of the puzzle there. If he's caught with two other reds in there, it's not going to work out. I'm going to work on my posture. Every one of these snap cuts to us, so I, I could just hear my mom, <laughs> sit up! <laughs> All right, so there he is, Kelvin Law again. Uh, very, very composed. Brody, I think, had the most emotion uh, so far today with the the exasperated ah. in the Oakenold turn for sure. Been there. I mean, I know how it feels. It's not fun, but we haven't seen that starstruck, and that might be what closes the deal. It is a red. Oh, he's gonna hypothermia him. Unreal. Okay, so wow, completely unexpected. I love it. Hypothermia was one of the cards that was banned in uh, CC for a while. Basically, it's a Ice action and affliction basically attacks you control can't gain go again. Brutality. So all of those attacks Voltaire ain't 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 gonna help you. So the worst part is is like how do you cobble together a hand? Like this is where ice quakes feel good. You know, rather than going wide, maybe you stack a couple ice quakes together and go tall, but I think a couple of those have already gone. Yeah, and, and you know, Kelvin has played so carefully. We've said he's been so conservative with his life total that, you know, it, if Brody is only able to deploy one attack because they can't get go again, Kelvin can say, I'm taking it, keeping my whole hand, and, and closing out the game. Now you can kind of see why this card was a silver bullet for so many so many decks. Yeah, this is this is a powerful effect. You don't see it very often, but just coming up at the perfect possible time here. Kelvin thinking about it. Feeling good here. Brody evaluating what has been played, what does he have access to? What's left? Again, the stakes very high for both players, but a little bit more heavy towards Kelvin here because he cannot drop another game. It's a best of three series. Day three, the finals of the celebrational here in Queenstown. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. I time walk your time walk. It's like I, I just bought a turn, but now I'm going to buy a turn. Like it's happened on both sides of the, uh, it's happened on both sides of the board now. It just feels, it feels bad, but at the same time, you know, like, it's like, dude, it's like, what do you want? What was my options here? You stacked four frostbites on me. I could only swing hammer, or I can basically say, we'll, we'll just take two turns off. Well, and, yeah, I mean, if you're in Brody's seat, you're like, you know, I, I kind of got you, right? I got you to pay three for this card. You don't have enough resources in your hand to do anything. You've got all these frostbites. Ha, ha, ha. I'm going to get the six-card hand on my turn. 
Did Kelvin just switch sides on the hammer? I don't know. It, it, it definitely started on top okay, uh, during the game, but it might have rotated. Okay. I, I thought he was just trying to go goofy on this one. No. You know, you swap it on the other side just to maybe psych out Brody. It's like, all right, you were expecting a, a, you know, a right hook, but now I'm going southpaw on you. I, I think, I wonder if it's like a weightlifting thing where you need to keep both the arms strong. Well, it's a one-handed weapon. You got to think that that thing weighs yeah. a ton. No, I agree. But then again, look how beefy this dude is. I mean, Starvo is out there just absolutely just cranking these curls with that big hammer. Ah, <laughs> uh, CYK Lionel is like one of my favorite people. He's such a, just this bastion of joy at any event that I see him. Yep. Big hugs, big smiles all the time. He always brings me goodies from uh, from his hometown, and I goodies do work on you. Goodies, I mean, if you want a free pass to being in my good books, it all it takes is a bag of M and M's, <laughs> peanut preferably, or Skittles. If you bring me Skittles, <laughs> I mean, I'll be nice to you. Yeah, but I'm not returning your calls. Oh, that, that, that's where it is. That's the line. Yeah, you got to draw it somewhere. Okay. You did enjoy some chocolate yesterday. I did. So um, for those who are unaware, I am currently on a little bit of a diet, and I've been exceptionally dedicated to it. Yes, I said during this trip, I'm going to have one instance of like a treat. It was my birthday on Wednesday, so I'm like, I'm going to treat myself to one thing. And like a lot of things were offered, but I'm like, I don't want this. I don't want this. And then we went to an ice cream shop called Patagonia, which had, uh, they had an in-house chocolate. Mm -hmm. So you had ice cream, mm -hmm. which was delicious. I I assume. Oh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my. I ice watched cream. you. Like you were in another planet, and yeah, I got. Yeah, we we had some people trying to talk to us. Yeah, we're like, dude, we're we're no. Uh, it was ice cream time. Uh, here's rain razors. I'm gonna finish this chocolate thing real quick because I had three pieces of chocolate and it was this delicious. But rain razors on top of an infecting shot is just as sweet. This yeah. thing is gonna be brutal now even if this hits and kelvin ignores the blood rot he can stay alive but it is uh, it is as as potent of an offensive damage related attack that brody can can cobble together here yeah i think this was the best possible he's saying you know if you cover this with three cards you're you're left with one the most you can do is hammer me and and i can play out of that situation but, I mean, if Kelvin finds the magic recipe of all three elements, a red earth attack, let's say, or that starstruck, just going over the top, dominating, and Brody at four, he doesn't have much latitude. Now, keep in mind, a lot of people forget New Horizon does block for two. Yep. The Tunic's a one block. You never want to give up the New Horizon just, like, willy-nilly. It is a last-ditch effort res like just to stay alive to complete a game. But ha have you won games where you've blocked with New Horizon? I, I have. But I, I'll tell you, it is just such a Herculean effort after that where, where, you know, a lot of times when you block with the, the New Horizon, you're also losing, you know, two Arsenal cards. And it just feels so backbreaking at that point. So in uh, Kelvin's hand, I see lightning, I see ice, and I see earth. But, and a, I, but the problem is I also see a sink below. And if that earth card is blue... It's not going to be as potent of an attack. It would basically be a seven dominate go again, which is still pretty nasty, but it doesn't get the job completely done. It would probably require a piece of equipment to cover it up further. So he's going to throw an autumn's touch to block three of the five. Uh, sorry, of the eight, five leak, meaning he's down to six and a blood rot token. The first of the, the first of the day. It's not even cold foil. Brody's slacking here. And, and this is one of the few times where we've seen Kelvin take more damage than he needed to. On my turn. So it, it's going to be interesting to see you know, what, what he does on his own turn, what he arsenals, and you know how that plays out. I was so curious about how this matchup would unfold. I thought it was going to be over a lot sooner mm -hmm. um i thought that it was just going to be one was going to take the driver's seat it was going to be a lot of trading damage but it has been a little bit different it, it's been very careful on both sides of the board like we said brody's shown up with a, a slightly more disruptive build of lexi and because of that it hasn't been just three attacks each turn over and over it's been a little more dancing parrying back and forth where you know, each one's looking for the upper hand. And every time it seems like 
one of them has a big advantage, it swings back in the other one's favor. So even Steven in the polls there, Craig, 50-50 of who's going to win. It's incredible how this happens. And look at this. So throw in the seven. Again, awkward numbers. This isn't just tossing a three in front of this, yep. Craig. This is going to require a little bit more reach in order to stay alive. Red Autumn's touch. Back in the day, the first sort of wave of restrictions or bans in the Starvo era, they targeted Autumn's touch, which kind of caught everyone off guard, and I thought that was a really apropos ban. Yeah, I mean, LSS has done a great job with um, using a light touch whenever possible in their bans, where they say, hey, we, we still want this to be a deck. We want people to use, be able to use all these like awesome legendaries and you know you spent all the time opening packs trading for cards buying singles we still want you to be able to show up with starvo so how do we do that without having starvo just win every single tournament seven attack on the autumn's touch commons being banned to nerf a hero like yeah. starvo is such a, a fascinating narrative there but again it's calculated you know the earth, the block three, the seven, it's, it's, it does what it does. My favorite set, Tales of Aria. Yeah, it's definitely way up on my list. It might be my favorite. I can tell you from a limited standpoint, uh, I think it was my favorite set. But to be honest, after everything we've seen, I'm, I'm expecting heavy hitters to, to take that place. Yeah, double block of two frost locks. Oftentimes, it's just pitch fodder anyways, so it's not like you're giving up any attack value with it. So the two frost locks are gone. One damage leaks through. Brody getting a little bit closer. So Kelvin inching closer to the uh, the finish line here. Tunic to two. Uh, Voltaire. So the pitch stack, another situation here that you got to keep in mind as the game sort of rolls on, as a lot of the cards that you've dealt with, we've seen those frost locks be pitched multiple times and now they're back in the hand so brody the level and the skill and the and the attention to detail that he has he knows what's coming around he knows what he's pitched he knows the potential reach that he's going to have here as this codex of frailty has hit the board and it's bringing with it a little nyquil yeah the sleep dart this is interesting because you know if you're in brody's seat you're saying I need to make multiple attacks. I, I need to threaten Kelvin's life enough to force him to block with cards out of his hand because, you know, when it comes down to two-card hands, Kelvin's starting to, to have the advantage where he's able to just throw a seven. His hammer is so effective off of one-card hand. And so if they get in this situation where they're both required to block with two or three cards every turn, Kelvin's in a much better spot. So, you know, a lot of the times that I'm playing against Lexi, you have to do a little bit of the uh, keeping inventory. Yeah, the bookkeeping. Basically, and what are you counting? You're counting, okay, how many um, three of a kinds did I see? Well, all three are gone. How many rain razors have been used? Three of them are gone. Codexes, three of them are gone. So Kelvin is now thinking much in the same capacity that Brody was saying, all right, well, that's the Crippling Crush, that's the Okanold, I haven't seen the Starstruck. Kelvin's doing the same kind of uh, of bookkeeping, as it were, to make sure that he's aware of some of those bigger power plays and what what kind of reach Brody still has left uh, that he has to worry about. A absolutely, and, and this is an interesting spot for Kelvin. I, I believe there's another Spinal Crush in his hand. The last one. And, and so it's... Do I fully cover this and, and send back this big nine attack and, and basically eat all of Brody's hand? Or, you know, no, like, I don't really want to go to two here if I don't have to. And so it's it's all this careful, careful consideration. Codex of Frailty dropped a ponder on Brody's side and left that nasty little Frailty token for Kelvin. Frailty token giving minus one to attacks out of arsenal and weapon attacks. Blocking here with flash and spinal. So covering it just, just right. No damage done. And the ponder is going to draw up for Brody and he's going to opt to probably hold it in hand. I mean, I don't know what other natural go against he's going to have, but he can't he occupy that. Uh, oh, he's going to do it. So it, again, he's, he's running, I think, nine. Winter's Bites. So if you found like a yellow Winter's Bite or one of the blues, that's the perfect spot for it is right there in that arsenal. Yeah, it's, de it's definitely just not a generic arrow that doesn't have go again. 
And, I mean, we did see two or three Starvo fuses, but a lot of the work here has been done. I mean, the, the Okanold was devastating, let's get real here, but Kelvin has no qualms about just sending the standard seven for the you know, three for seven. And I think that it, it's kind of wearing down Brody because the last one cooked him for one. This one might cook him for one. And that's just what it takes eventually. And when you're building these decks as, uh, as Bravo, you're like, all right, well, I'm going to need earth cards. So I'm not going to fuse all the time. And I think seven for uh, three for seven is good enough. And I yeah. think he's loaded his deck with these evergreens, these breakgrounds and the autumn's touches to do just that. Yeah, the, the patient approach, right? Pr preserve my life for a little block almost as much as possible and grind out these games with just the, the slimmest of margins. And, it, you know, when, when you're playing against Brody, it, if I sat down across from Brody, I'd say, no, I need to play a more high rolly game, right? He's going to make so many better decisions throughout the game where he's, he's picking up these incremental advantages. So let's shorten the game as much as possible, see if I get a little bit lucky and I can win the game that way. No, Kelvin's on the same level as Brody here where he's able to make these fantastic decisions. Um, I, I'm just so impressed from the gameplay on both sides of the board. It has been a gritty, gritty game. Turn 13. It's uh, approaching at 12.30 in the afternoon here local in Queenstown. We thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world. It's uh, a little interesting. Again, global game. Time zones are a thing. Us getting acclimated to it. Everybody else tuning in all over the world. Some are eating breakfast. Some are, some are just, you know pounding caffeine just to sort of stay awake through it and we got uh you know about 1200 people that are along for the ride so we we appreciate you we love you and they're here for a good reason I, our players are putting on an absolute show right this is a master class uh i felt like the first game that we saw was just a spectacular watch i'm definitely gonna go back and watch it again when i get home this game has just been an absolute blast it, it, just a banger back and forth where you can't tell who's gonna win the game both of them making these very cagey decisions that you wouldn't normally see. And so I, I, I'm just pumped. I'm, I'm enjoying this so much, and I know that the, the people here are getting the show that they deserve. No, they're getting one hell of a show, and I mean, it might be a little slower paced at this point, but it's because the stakes are so high. Oh, yeah. The margins for error are inexistent. So, again, I just want to let everybody know that right over here is a very unique trophy. The Queenstown celebrational champion is what these players are playing for it's right there just looming large for these players to just remember it's like hey if you want to sort of rush through a turn this is what's at stake and you can't just take anything for granted here and none of these players have kelvin law the number one lifetime xp earner in the world brody spurlock the number two who is hot on his heels and i say hot on his heels in the term of like yeah there's uh, there's so much space and distance from a a, a, a you know a volume perspective, but he is accumulating points like they're going out of style. Like he's picking them up like Pokemon. It's unreal how fast Brody has closed that gap. It, it's the momentum, right? Where he's had such a strong year this previous year. He's done well at so many of the high level events and it looks like he's not going to slow down anytime soon. Well, and it's not just like it's a, it's something that isn't on his mind that it's like, oh, you know, I, whatever, I get XP points. He is dead set on being the number one. Yep. He has that motivation. He has that ambition. He's a young man. He's 18 years old. He's been playing for several years, and he has been winning for just as long. And he wants to be that number one top dog, not just from an ELO perspective, a world champion perspective. Nope. He wants to be the number one on every leaderboard that exists. He wants to collect all the Infinity Stones. Damn right. Yeah, exactly. And he, he just, the greatest horse impression I've ever heard, too. <laughs> I mean, I, you can't blame him because what a lot of people forget is, sure, it's the first match of the day. But we went through two back-to-back -back grueling days of, I say hiking up a hill. But, you know, like you like travel to a venue that isn't, you know, isn't exactly... Um, a familiar. It's not in our backyard. That's it's for sure. It's not in our backyard. They got on a plane to Auckland. Brody traveling 20 to 25 hours. Then we got on a plane to Queenstown early in the morning. Mm -hmm. We got settled in a hotel. And the next morning, it's like, 
let's go. Like, you have to play. So it has been a grueling journey for all the players here, and it has culminated to this as Brody goes down to two, activating uh, Lexi Livewire here to reveal an Ice Quake. Yeah, and, and we knew that that had to be one of these ice, you know, non-attack actions with Go again. Uh, it, it's a good spot for it, that's for sure. And, you know, now that there's not the Tunic on the board, these Frostbite tokens are much more impactful because it means that, you know, Kelvin can't pitch a red to activate the, the Crown of Seeds anymore. Kelvin can't play defense reactions for free anymore because he doesn't have that free Tunic resource. So it, it is interesting that this little bit of disruption becomes more and more important as the game goes on. It's important because, and this is why it's on the stack right now, because you're right, as soon as you have Frostbite hits the board, it's like reds are reds don't exist. It's like they're, they're kind of worthless to that degree. So he's going to read the Ice Quake here. It's the blue, so it's plus one, but it does create a on-hit Frostbite trigger again. And uh, Kelvin here is just kind of, you know, it, you can't see it on his face, but these frostbites have been just brutal for him throughout the entire game. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So as you can see over here, here's Lexi. She's kind of hovering. Nope, that's not Lexi. Uh, it, but the, there's the Celebrational Tournament trophy again. Uh, but here's Lexi. So Lexi's just on the stack, if you're wondering why it's uh, it's here. Basically what happened is Lexi's ability allows you to flip a card in Arsenal if it's an ice card, which this is. That's the ice quake. Uh, it will create a frostbite token. However, that's an action, and it adds an opportunity to respond, which Kelvin is doing right now. I think he's thinking, like, do I want, before the frostbite resolves, do I want a crown of seats? Yeah, and it's, I, I think the decision is, do I want to turn potentially a, like a red two block in my hand? into a new card with the Crown of Seeds, where I've got now one point of prevention floating, and my two block has been, you know, replaced with a different card. Definitely. All right, so the Ice Quake finally uh, is being played because the Frostbite was resolved. Kelvin Law just saying, all right, go for it. Let's see what happens. The Ice Quake pairing up with a, uh, the Bolton shot that was living there already. Great peanut butter and jelly play here because the plus one on the Bolton shot means that it does get go again, yep. and now there's a reload threat as well. Super important. With two floating, though, you don't necessarily want to do the reload because you want to use the plus one off the bow. But it's there if you want it. It's an, op it's an option. So he's going to crown of seeds now, breaking through the frostbite. And sometimes you want the frostbite to resolve now. Yes. So that you can break it so that on your turn you don't have to worry about it. And I think that may be the math that Calvin was trying to figure out peer into the future how when do i want to break the frostbite why well, i i also wouldn't be surprised if we see a d react here yep 100 percent. the sink below um as well as the prevention from crown of seeds as well yeah so this is going to cover this up perfectly real clean cover here so sink below uh did he opt to sink i believe he did so he's going to put a card at the bottom of the deck to draw one up sink below again just an iconic card um it, it, it's a common that should be a rare. It's so great. I opened a red German sink below. In oh, that that's sweet. Yeah, well, at dinner yesterday with the wonderful folks from White Rabbit Gaming in Germany, they, they gave, they put some um, German history packs. Yep, to everyone. And said, everybody, thank you so much. Let's all go. We had some fun uh, pronouncing the words, which were great. Dude, the, the community here has been um, just the best possible experience. And uh, along the German history pack lines, I did end up with a Das Inner Beast. Oh, yeah. that's really cool. Plus one. I got a I got a red fate for scene in mine. I got a red sink below in mine, and I got a time snap potion. And I will not even attempt to tell you how to pronounce it. Wow, you, your pack was actually a banger, huh? It was. There was. It was all. It was. I got a blue debilitate. No, blue choke slam. Okay. Right, choke and slamming. That just made that up. I don't know. That's going next to your uh, French cards. You're yes, just gonna have to confuse everybody. Yep. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you read the cards, no problem. Go ahead. So, Sleep Dart. There it is. A little arrow with some NyQuil on the tip. Going to go ahead and try to shut off the Starvo app, uh, ability here. But I don't think that we're going to see many Starvos here because I think there's going to be a lot more blocking and just swinging awkward numbers at this point. So, six attack is still nasty. He's going to take... Yes. Okay, so... What am I missing here? I guess he's just anticipating that, yeah, it's going to connect. Yeah, no, yeah, he has not blocked yet. 
So again, Sleep Dart's so potent here because basically if it hits, they lose all the hero card effects and activated abilities. Okay. Okay, go to three. All right, well, he's going to take a little bit. Frostbite on hit. And Starvo is asleep. I like how Brody put that. He said, Starvo is asleep. My turn. To you. All right, so the Frostbite still looming large. Looks like not much of a turn left. So draw it up. Thaw out the Frostbite. Back to Brody. Brody's going to have a four-card hand to potentially put this one away. He has a Heat Seeker. He has a Winter's Bite. Is that a Polar Blast? Double Ice Quake. That is a yeah. oof, that's a great card to have. And, and you know, this is one of the problems that you run into with Lexi as we get late, late, deep in the game. Is that you've just been pitching blue cards and playing your red arrows throughout the game, and now that you're in the late game, you're, you're very low on arrows and a lot of the cards that you do have have just such a lower impact because they're blue cards instead of red cards. So a very, very important turns coming up here as both players have these razor-thin margins that they can play with. Kelvin at three, but he's down 0-1 in the series, losing to KO, armed and dangerous, as Betsy in a very spectacular match. If you haven't seen it, I... I highly recommend that uh, you go take a look at that sometime this week because it was just haymakers back and forth and these spectacular parries. Yeah, yeah. So much fun to watch that one. Okay. Okay. This one is coming right down to the end. Uh, yeah, we, we see Brody, nine cards left, and it, it's almost not a problem. Like, like, obviously, only nine cards left is a problem, but just as big of a problem is... is how many of those are actually arrows that, that are able to threaten Kelvin's life total, right? Well, this is why when you're thinking about it, you never think that in this particular case, you thought you were either going to get blown out or blow out the uh, blow out the, the Starvo. So the other option there is if you think it would have gone the distance, a card like uh, Quiver of Abyssal Deaths could have rescued some of those arrows. Sure. But he went for the Bag of Leaves instead. But here's a fat boy arrow as we got Ice Quake into Ice Quake into Heater. And, uh, I mean, 10 damage is pretty nasty. But, again, if, if Kelvin is thinking, I might just wait you out. Yeah, if this is a fatigue situation, it's an easy, easy decision to just cover this off. A hundred percent. You just toss the entire bag in front of it and say, try again, my friend. And you know that that's one less red arrow. That's one less red ice quake to pump it up. You, you, I think those three arrow turns are a thing of the past. If Brody can cobble together two arrows to, you know, at a time, then Kelvin will have given himself a little bit of wiggle room where he can take one awkward number, one awkward number, one leak, one leak, and then maybe Brody's out of gas. So, Brody's been in this position before. I've seen Brody pull rabbits out of his hat when he's got n almost nothing left. Um, this is where pitch discipline early on can come into play. A lot of players will say, well, I got red arrows. I'm just going to send them as fast and furious as possible. But if you save nothing for later, you're going to be pretty hungry for some damage. And it looks like Brody here has done a really good job of actually cobbling together not a wide turn, but a tall turn. And, and it's... It, it speaking to that it's such a delicate balancing act that you need to do where you know kelvin's at three life and you say man if i just used one more red arrow earlier in the game maybe that would have been the tipping point for me to have won by now but also maybe if i just pitched one more red arrow I into my deck and left it there waiting for me it would be the extra juice that i need to cross the finish line perfect tens on both sides of the board couple of ice cards that block for two. The earth cards blocking for a total of six. Kelvin just saying, yeah, all right. Let's run it back. Try yeah. again. Okay, we see some arrows here. All righty. Uh, pair of searing shots, I think. Yeah. Pair of searing shots. You do have some blue ice to actually fuel a big turn. So Brody might have something to do here. This is a potent hand. This is, this is, this is very strong. And we're talking about awkward numbers, right? Sending those fours where I say, okay, Kelvin would be happy to leak one here and there. He's got the space, but a, a searing shot kind of takes away that, that leeway that he was trying to give himself. And, and, you know, Kelvin always wants to have that arsenal card so he can use Crown of Siege to potentially cover up that little bit of extra damage. And 
you know, he had to use all of his resources on the previous turn, so he doesn't have that option now. It's an incredible, incredible game that we're witnessing here, Craig. I mean, Brody Spurlock has won so many events. Kelvin Law is synonymous with flesh and blood. Both these players are giving no room to the other player, not giving up an inch. They have dug in here. They're double checking what has come to pass, but what will come to be is what we are looking forward to here. This is game two. Will there be a third game? Kelvin Law wants one. Brody Spurlock wants to just shut this down and finish up. I mean, there's XP to be had in the side events, bro, uh, uh, Craig. I mean, lock up this one and yeah. then move on to the next challenge. Yeah, get the yep. pocket the one XP here and go start doing some sides. I mean, that's kind of what Brody's thinking about right here, too. I mean, the trophy's nice, but you damn well know that if he wins here, he's going to be like, has the Super Armory begun? He, he is not taking the rest of the weekend off. No, not at all. <laughs> Kelvin is very composed, calm. Like, look at the complete difference between the two. Kelvin, cards on the table, sitting calmly. Brody has been rifling through these. Definitely more energetic, but I, I, I think Brody is feeling it. You know, we, we saw this with the, the Oak and Old turn, right, where he was definitely more animated and, and more energetic, a lot more movement but he was still very patient in his decision-making. Well, we're at the point where the game is old enough to drive now. Just turned 16. Wow, yeah, get that provisional license in the U.S. When, uh, you know, in Canada, when do they, what age do they give the kids their first moose? <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was like, which way are we going with this mess? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the that's the that's the fallacy of it all. Because you're not given a moose; you grow up with it. Oh, yeah. When you're like... born, you know the tradition is you're given a baby moose to sort of grow up alongside it, and then you basically ride it into the Arctic, and you come back an adult. So, so this almost like Frozen. To a degree, yeah. yeah. Like, remember in the 300, it's like, oh, King Leonidas gets tossed into the wilderness. He fights off those uh, those wolves. He comes back king. He survived. It's kind of what happens with Canadians. That's why we're so damn badass. Yeah, I, yeah you, re you really are. That's, <laughs> that's the one way the Canadians get described all the time. <laughs> Searing shot with the four go again. But once again, talking about margins for error, awkward number four here. And if this was something like a drill shot, you might let the one leak because you got two more life to play with. You cannot do this with this. On hit, your opponent will lose one extra life. So uh, Kelvin has to cover this, but he has no more equipment left, and he can't rely on Crown of Seeds to sort of cover these breakpoints. So he's just going to toss two cards in front of it. I think that Kelvin Law has basically dug in to say that we're going the distance here. I am not going to win off of... Uh, fusing. I'm not going to win with my hammer. I'm going to win when you run out of gas. A hundred percent. Absolutely. But if you are Kelvin and you look down at a hand that has all of these two blocks in it and your opponent leads with a four power attack, you're actually, you know, doing backflips. You're happy in this situation. Okay. So we started with the four go again, and we're moving now to one of those last uh, Winter's Bites that remain. It's a yellow's Winter's Bite. Brody running all nine Winter's Bites. Going to discard the red card in Autumn's Touch. So there's some of that potency. Oh, and this, this could just be the game right here. That Winter's Bite. Incredible. Brody found the, the exact right line to close out this game. Oh, my God. What that a... That will do it. Last second steal of this game. It was set up the whole way. Brody leaning on a yellow's Winter's Bite after a two-card block. Peels the last card away. Loads up that arrow. They were just waiting for their time to shine. Searing shot for five. Is blocked by three. And he even provided changes. This was incredible of what a matchup. Craig, crazy, crazy finish. And, you know, Brody just so care. Both players so careful throughout the game, finding every point of value on every turn. And, you know, the exact amount of damage. You know, there, there was nothing to spare there at the end of that game. 
And uh, so big congratulations to Brody Spurlock of uh, Texas in the United States this is our celebrational winner here in Queenstown. A masterful move of a, of a finish there. I think he just he had one more one more kick at the can. It had to line up just so beautifully like that, Craig, and incredible how that all paired together. Kelvin Law did an incredible job, but Starvo didn't fuse the way Starvo would otherwise fuse, and ultimately Brody Spurlock is your celebrational champion. Just it's just so much back and forth. I love it. The spectacular matches all weekend long. A very deserving champion. I, I my energy level is through the roof right now. This was so fun being part of this experience, and just the the matches just just blowing me away. It's it's amazing because Brody obviously is going to be over the moon. It's another yep. feather in his cap, another trophy for the mantle, a very unique one and all the developers at LSS are going to be knocking their heads against the wall <laughs> to try to sort out what they committed to, which is now when I when I heard about the create a card situation, mm -hmm. I thought it was everyone submits one and they will pick a few and then they'll choose a winner based on no. ingenuity. No, they flat out committed. They just, they doubled down. They said, if you win the tournament, the card that you submit, not like we'll work with you no, to no, make no, no. one. They're not, they're not printing that exact card. Well, not exactly. There's no way they, they, they will work with him to, to massage this card back to something that, you know, is a little more yeah. simple. Yeah, they'll bring it back from the upside down to bring it to reality. Uh, yeah. Ultimately, congratulations. Yeah, big time to Brody Spurlock. But his face, his likeness on a card. Start practicing drawing glasses, I guess, and ham sandwiches. I mean, the kids got it made in the shade here. All right, so here's the deal, friends. Uh, the celebrational is over to a degree. I mean, the games are done, but we're going to hear from Brody Spurlock. So don't go too far, friends. We're going to hear from the champ himself. Brody Spurlock will join us after a short break. Don't go too far. We're live in Queenstown. Is never done. Huh. We'll fight for fame and go to the same sun. Laughing in, we put it all at stake. Huh. But it's so worth it when you, you see, see the change. With a wager there and a wager, fight this hero, fight a righteous fight. With a wager, jelly, a wager, fold this hero, sorry, will some be told so smash your ring.
the champ is here. How often have you seen that or heard that? I mean, you're the champion of so many different tournaments. You've won so much in your life. What is this, though? This is something different, my friend. This is the Queenstown Celebrational Championship. This has got to feel different. This is incredibly special to me. Honestly, I was thinking about it this morning. Um, despite not battling for large cash prizes today, this, this event today, these games I just played, mattered more to me than the games I played in the top eight of Pro Tour Baltimore. Which really? Is, sounds crazy, but like to me, the chance to help design a card is such a unique opportunity that has never been like uh, given to anyone in Flesh and Blood yet outside of the LSS studio. So to be able to fight for that and earn it is like the coolest prize in the world. It's worth the world. Well, you said earn it, and I think that's a very apropos word to use there. Let's take a look at the card that you are submitting here. Uh, there's uh, some of your accolades as Brody has created this this absolute, uh, this this cipher, this, this cryptic, um, you know, I think if you read this, you, it, it just, it unlocks the Pharaoh's tomb or something, but walk us through this card and how you came up with it, the spirit of it, and what did you want to sort of accomplish by creating Silent Auction? So I wanted a couple things with Silent Auction. The first was I just wanted a card that made me think a lot. My favorite card in the game right now has become the Ark Knight. And the reason I love it so much is no matter how much I play Viserai, every time I draw that card, I have to tank and think about like all the possible lines. Um, you can fetch any card from your deck, and the fact that Rattlebones exists means you can usually fetch any card from your graveyard as well, any attack, that is. So I just wanted something like that that had so many options and so much to think about. And then, as I was thinking about it more, I also really liked the idea of this kind of bidding life thing where you have to try to predict how highly your opponent is going to value whatever and how much they'd be willing to stake for it. And you both kind of have to like play this game of wits and it feels kind of like a, like almost like a, there's no bluffing involved, but like you can bid zero or you can bid like whatever it's worth to you. And I would, it, when this card gets printed, I am really curious to see kind of how the like meta of that develops. Um, I know there's been some feedback that the card is very complicated, so it's quite possible that we're going to try to peel back some of the layers of this and really just boil it down to the core of like what I like about it. But the reason that it ends with search your deck for a card is partly just as like a, I suppose, tribute to become the Arc Knight because that's my favorite card, um, but also just because I think if I'm looking for something that makes me think a ton, nothing does that more than a tutor. You have so many options. And then, um, of course, there are even more things to think about with the bidding life. It, this originally was just an action card with Go Again. And then um, I went through several iterations of it. I was talking with Mara earlier this week about like how to make it feel kind of balanced or at least like both players have some control over it. And so making it an aura where either player can uh, continue just prolonging it and say, no, not this turn, I think gives you a lot to think about. It feels like almost like a little mini game. That's what I was, the way that I describe it, it's a game within a game. Yeah, and I think that's great in the spirit of it. I mean, obviously, you said that it's a very complex card. I think we simplified it down to complex, but it's going to be something that you're going to work with LSS to make sure that this is a card that it's going to not just uh, be playable, obviously, but it's a card that people are going to want to try out and have a little bit of that head game space to it. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, I, I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about the, you know, not just the celebrational experience because it's been great. Um, People are going to probably ask you a little bit about your decision for Lexi into uh, this gauntlet of obviously these living legend dynamos like Chain and Starvo. I thought that it would be a good option, and you were the only one who brought it. And when you were you were when you brought it, I was it kind of just you know pumps your confidence. I'm like, wow, if, if Brody brought it, I mean, there's got to be something there. What was your logic for bringing Lexi to this tournament? There were a couple things I was thinking. Um, the first thing to mention is just that at this point. Um, even though I would like to pretend it's still Viserai, Lexi is the hero I know the best. I played it so much last year at a ton of callings and battle hardens and the pro tour. And so I don't know how to pilot any hero better than I know Lexi. And I wanted to bring Viserai to this tournament, and I think he's actually pretty decent. Um, I think he is a real contender, but he just had some weaknesses, and I decided I uh, would rather play the deck that I think had a better chance of winning. But ultimately... I feel like so many decks in this format want to try to keep a five-card hand to do their crazy powerful thing, and a lot of them aren't very good at blocking. Like, Fi and Starvo both have 
a lot of two blocks, and Fi absolutely wants to keep all of his cards, and Starvo needs to be able to keep at least three cards to do his Starvo Fuse. So just playing like nine Winner's Bite and all these ways to strip cards, chilling Ice Fane to like force your opponent to interact on your turn, I just wanted to stop people from holding big hands. That's awesome. And um, the biggest part of this, as you explained to me, I think yesterday, was that, yeah, there's a card design on the line, there's a cool trophy, but there's one XP. That is, okay, I will not lie and say that that means the most to me. The card design is incredible. But the one XP is a big deal. Kelvin and I are like two of the XP leaders, and I'm trying to catch up to him. He's currently the world number one. And so I am one XP closer. I, it's actually, I'm two XP closer in the race. Because if I had lost, not only would I have not have gained the XP, he would have. So this is a two XP gain in the race from like my 5k something to his 7k something. Yeah, One only... of these days, I'm going to be at 1 XP above him. And... A 0.1% gain. That is... It takes little bits. And that is actually very, uh, um, you know, appropriate because the game that you played was all about little bits of chunk and little bits of chunk. Now, I want to ask you just quickly about that last sequence there. It seemed like Kelvin definitely trying to change gears and said, I'm just going to block you out. You're, you're running out of gas. That last Bastion of Hope, the two Searing Shots and the Yellow Winter's Bite, you knew they were coming. You had that stack coming. Was there anything left after that? Or was it just throw caution to the wind, one more Hail Mary, let's try to get there? There was one more turn coming after that, and then that was really it. But the main thing that I was thinking about that whole time was his Sink Blows. Um, I didn't see them at all in like, basically in like all of first cycle or most of first cycle uh, at some point he pitched one to play the hypothermia which by the way that hypothermia was nuts there was like nothing he could possibly do on that turn um i thought to slow me down i was going to have a nuts rain razors turn and i thought that was going to be it and then when he played hypothermia well you you, you basically slammed the door on him with four frostbites and yeah. he came back and just jammed it shut on the other side too so that was it it was like we both kind of took a turn off in that case but that last bastion of hope those that searing into yellow into into searing did you did you when did you know you had it? Uh, as soon as he blocked two cards on the first searing, I thought I that well, I didn't technically know I had the win locked at that point, but that basically locks it because if he had a sink below, he would have played it. Um, and uh, my hand after that was red chilling ice vein, red searing shot, yellow winner's bite, and blue winner's bite. So I had another hand of like two arrows, kind of some weird winner's bite disruption. I had to think about the possibility that if I don't go all out this turn, he can arsenal. If he arsenals the sink below, I'm probably definitely losing. So I think if he has the sink, I lose no matter what, maybe, is what I think. Um, You're asking me, man. I, uh... <laughs> but then if I yellow winner's bite in the next turn without a frostbite, he can just crown, so it's kind of weird. Um, ultimately, I think just playing out my hand made the most sense because as long as he doesn't have a sink below, I win. All right, man. Um... I'm sure you want to go do some armories because uh, that XP gain, you, you, the one is something, but everything else. So the last thing, uh, we're going to have Kelvin on, and I, I just want you to say some good things about your opponent. I'm not, this is not to squeeze it out of you, but like we, we've had such a great time all week, and I know your opponent is somebody that you've been chasing, and you got to admire uh, his game plan and how his composure and everything in that match. Absolutely. Kelvin was genuinely such a kind and gracious opponent. I played him twice today and once yesterday and just very friendly, very courteous. I uh, really enjoyed our games. We There was like, it was uh, kind of that nice balance that I feel like you get a lot in Flesh and Blood where we're both taking it very seriously and we know we're kind of like playing at the highest level here. But at the same time, like we're being casual with each other, like just having a good time, enjoying the game. I also want to give a few shout outs real quick. Um, just, first of all, thank you so much to LSS for bringing, bringing us all here and hosting this celebrational. It's been absolutely incredible. Thank you, uh, for, thank you to MinMax Games for supporting me and uh, cheering me on. I saw on Twitter and just from back home in the States. And a couple thank yous to my mom for always supporting me in my Flesh and Blood career and uh, everything she does for me. I absolutely could not do it without her. And Mara Ferris for just kind of being my buddy from the Wolfpack here all week, helping me prep for all these formats, talking it through. Michael Fang just got in yesterday, helped me kind of logic out what I wanted to do this morning, which format to do first. Um, yeah, my whole team, everyone here. It's been a fantastic time. I'm really, really grateful and so happy to have taken this down. And Ethan, Ethan for being the real MVP in the background. Oh, there's Ethan. Oh, we also get a little bonus Alex Norville action on that one too, which you may have missed. So, Brody, well earned. I don't think anyone's really surprised that you won this. It has been an incredible week of flesh and blood. You are the celebrational champion. This is an incredibly unique trophy. You went through not only a gauntlet of incredible players, but 
different formats and changing your sort of changing speeds and everything. Congratulations, my friend. Now go get like nine more XP on a draft or something, all right? Thanks, Blake. No worries, brother. All right, friends. Uh, we've got a little video kind of recapping a little bit of everything going on here at the Celebration. And then we're going to talk to Kelvin Law. So don't go too far. Check out what we Hang loose, brother. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Celebrational. I'm Craig Kremples. I'm here with our runner-up, Kelvin Law. L listen, just a, a spectacular performance the entire week. Thank it was you. absolutely a treat watching you battle and also just being around you for all of the events that we've been at. So I just wanted to thank you for that experience. Um, your, your, your card, your invitational card, I was really impressed. The, the level of simplicity, but still a very interesting card. Will you just talk a little bit about how you arrived at this design? Sure, Craig. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the, cat, uh, the, the card um, uh, I would like to design is for Katsu because I, I love playing Katsu, but I don't think Katsu is good because there's so uh, not, not many KD fat for the Katsu combo card. So okay. that's why I, I create a, a, another Gus Wave combo card so that uh, kind of I would like to uh, buff Katsu and uh, yeah, hope uh, it could yeah, maybe a little bit uh, made it for, for uh, the fans of Katsu. Yeah. Okay, did you go through a couple of iterations? Did you talk with some friends about this? Did you start with something that didn't look quite like this card? I have sold to some of my friends and uh, some of my best friends playing Kesu as well. Okay. And they give uh, some uh, good advice, uh, useful advice to uh, uh, how to make it, uh, I would say, decent, not yep. so powerful. Yep. And But it's uh, also it's useful. You can keep, you, you can put it in, in your Kesu, Kesu deck. That's why I, I create this card. Yep. And before before I uh, bring it to, to, to here, I also send it to uh, the Hong Kong WhatsApp group. 
Okay. Um, so that everybody knows it. So uh, yeah, I I think uh, people from Hong Kong, yeah, will we'll be happy about about it. Yeah. Okay. So it's really launched. <laughs> you, you got a lot of feedback about the card. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. And li listen, I know losing in the finals always a little bit disappointing, <laughs> but the the total experience here, um, the the community at large. Oh. Just, being in New Zealand, oh. just just speak about y your experience. Okay, uh, I would say it would be my honor to be invited to you to join the celebrational event. First of all, it's a it's always good to meet the great player, great mm. head judges, uh, uh, great staff from LSS. Yeah, yep. and also I I think also that the schedule is a little bit tight, yep. but I, I love it. I love it because you can uh, have your tournament uh, in Sky Nine such a good place oh, beautiful. The, the landscape is is great it's good so yeah uh, i love it i love it yeah all right well listen we're gonna let you <laughs> we had promised that we were gonna open these two packs earlier in the day okay but you guys entertained us for so long that we didn't get around to opening them so we're gonna ask you to open an alpha pack and a first edition arcane rising pack here on the air and we'll just see if we can end this on a very happy note with a spectacular card oh i have a gust feeling here here's there is a a, a hot of a yando here yeah <laughs> really you're feeling it okay <laughs> just hold it up high okay. so we can see and here we go okay sure okay Should I? <laughs> Do you want to just get straight to the good stuff? Okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Is it a good stuff? Yeah, it's not the best stuff. Oh, I I sold all of it. <laughs> oh, I have a have a blue eye bracer. I think it's good. Okay. <laughs> The bracer. Oh. All right. So we're saving saving all the juice. Yes. yes. For the alpha pack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. That's definitely a dinger right there. Oh. Nice. Yeah, the 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 alpha the foil, foil yeah, showtime. showtime. Yep. Nice. That's a sweet hit. It's very nice. And and Vovia Veda, the red one. Okay. Yeah, we got good. a Snapdragon Scalers in there. Yeah. yeah. Savage Wing. Yep. It's good. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Again, okay. thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to thank the people of. Queenstown for making this event so special. They've been very gracious and, and just welcoming for everything that we've done. Uh, I want to thank the community at large. All of our competitors showed up and they gave it literally 110% round after round, just putting on a great show for us. I want to thank Savage Feats for making us look good. And I especially want to thank LSS for this absolute privilege, including all of us in this event. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. We're going to have another stream coming up shortly after this. I think we're going to be covering um, a little bit of the, the brand new Heavy Hitters Sealed Deck event. So stay tuned for that. Hang loose, brother. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs>